everybody. Welcome back to The Beard and the Bald. I am Paul Shirey, The Beard, joined by my compatriot, The Bald, Christopher J. Bumbray. Christopher W. Bumbray, actually. Fuck off. It's J. I say J. Chris C. J. Bumbray. You have to change your name for me. <laughs> Just because I like that intro better. So, uh, this week we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Travis Hobson. Uh, hey, Travis, hey. how are you? I'm good. So, if you guys are The Beard and the Bald, what does that make me? The Black? The the black. That's perfect. That the, I mean, the ball, the black. honestly, I was gonna say it, but I, I it was, it's okay. better coming from me. <laughs> yeah. it, does, it does make things a little easier to swallow if you say yeah. it, but yes, that is perfect. Yeah. I would agree with that. So three Travis, B's, Travis. Let's give you. Let's give some uh, some background on you, right? So hmm. how do you how do you and I know each other? You and I know each other uh, from Sundance. Um, We've both been going there for a long time, and, yep. and and for for me, it was always like, like there would only be a handful of people whose head was always down into their <laughs> laptop, like working. Yeah. It was like me and like one other person, and that was you. Yeah. And so we just started talking. <laughs> you guys <laughs> looked up, looked up from your computers. Just like, we're just trying to bang out reviews as quickly yeah. as possible because <laughs> travis travis files a lot of reviews like me that's the thing right you know you always you always say that i follow, file quite a few reviews and i usually do about 25 or something like that for the festival yeah. travis does quite a few too for his website punch drunk uh, punch drunk critics hmm? well it's yep. it's pretty rare i mean uh, you know i know all the other people that go to sundance and you know a lot of them they'll do like maybe 10 yeah you know reviews but mm -hmm. i think if you're gonna go for the whole festival man you gotta go for it well you gotta give a broad scope of what's been playing too that's the yeah, thing yeah you be no, you don't, yeah yeah you, you don't know, go there and just and just and, and i know some of those people that are like that they go there and they'll only review like the major films like yeah, like if they stupid. like the biggest films they'll go and review those and then everything else they'll sit on until they come out later or if they come out at all and i, I just don't think that's what that's what it's not getting the full worth of the festival because you know the stuff that people aren't talking about now I mean, is the stuff they're going to be talking about later Absolutely. so i'd rather i'd rather get get ahead of that stuff and put it and i try to review every movie i can like this yeah. year i think i reviewed everything except for relive which was just so awful that i decided <laughs> I didn't even bother i didn't and, think it's that bad <laughs> it, well, okay okay it was more like it was so mediocre like i, I, I didn't like i didn't have a strong opinion of it whereas i had De definitive opinions of everything else I saw, so Relive. I just like okay, I can forget that one. Relive is a is a Blumhouse movie with um with David <laughs> Oyelowo and Storm Reed, and it yeah. may or may not ever come out. <laughs> <laughs> it'll come out. I somehow. guarantee you, it'll come out. It will. It will yeah. come out, and it may find an audience because it is a largely African American cast. And as we saw just this week, oh yeah. god. Today, that movies yeah. that gear towards largely African American African American casts have uh an audience that that goes well beyond that so it's I, the second I, I it's that the is second largest a second largest original film opening in a, and since avatar i think or isn't it yeah yep yeah, yeah. yeah you can't crazy. you honestly can't you you can't overlook that aspect now thinking about yep. it this morning when i was driving to go get my coffee i was like you know I, I saw the uh, the box office. I was like, "Damn, massive!" Like us made a killing. And I was trying to think of another like you know, uh, African American led uh, horror film. I couldn't even think of one outside Tales of Get Out. Hood. Tales they, from the Hood. They, yeah, God. They, and, and that was like ago. what, like ten, fifteen years ago. Nineteen ninety four. And you, <laughs> yeah. now, like, or what was the, or like, the, the one with the one with Snoop Dogg? Uh, Bones. Yeah, like I mean, all... <laughs> what, what, what that, was that? What was that? that? Opened at one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> what was the Halloween where Busta Rhymes Kung Fu fought uh, Michael yes. Myers? Oh, oh god! Which one was that? Complete that wasn't H2O. That was after H two O, right? That was after H two O. Yeah, after H two O. It was the Halloween next... Resurrection. Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> so good. But anyways, like that. I mean, that is like. You can't overlook that, and because I think it is tapping into an, an underserved audience in that sense. You know, like there hasn't been that that kind of representation in that genre, and you know now Jordan Peele's brought it forward. I mean, that's a you know mostly all black cast. That's that's a big deal. So I would call that more of a big deal than fucking Captain Marvel uh, opening big, which is fine. But 
Uh, you know, the thing about us, though, which is interesting, though, is that, I mean, I've read interviews with Peel where he was saying that it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, as, as much of a, a, a racially themed movie as Get Out was. And I mean, it's right. not, though. I mean, us is, you know, it's, it's, it's a family. It's a family. It's not necessarily the fact that they're black or white that defines it. I mean, of course, it's, it's a thing, you know, but it's not, right. it's not really like. A which major, is great is to yeah. you know, make it normalize it like it could be any family which is great you know that's the way it should be i think that's I mean, that awesome. was that was my take i mean i don't know what was your takeaway on that on that aspect of it travis no i i agree with him it's it's not a movie that deals with race as overtly as, as get out does it's more societal as a whole yeah I think. absolutely um and I, you know we can you could probably argue about whether or not he's fully successful in in approaching some of the themes of the movie i, I would say that the movie works best for me when it's a straight up horror. <laughs> like I, like I thought it yeah. was like legitimately scary at times, which is not something I would say very often about horror movies. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was legitimately creepy, legitimately scary. Um, especially like when you get to the final act, when there's some of those themes he's trying to bring together, he's trying to bring together those themes. I don't think it works. You know, but, it's, it's interesting. You say uh, that actually Travis, because, um, I, I, I read your review before seeing the movie and yours was actually probably the first review that I read that wasn't, Totally, totally, totally effusive, right? This just, just call like you know I a masterpiece. Was embarrassed by some of the yeah. quotes I saw, like this is the greatest horror movie ever. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm horror. calling something a, master, a masterpiece too after it comes like, out, after what? it hasn't even it hasn't even opened yet, and they're calling it a masterpiece. Like, I mean, it's really hard to, to call a movie a masterpiece unless it's been around for at least like a decade. And you know, a masterpiece the, unless it's unless it stands the test of time. Yeah. You need some distance from those movies, whether or not they 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 have the same relevance, you know, regardless of the generation that's watching it. That's a masterpiece. Yeah, something that, yeah. You know, something that came out last week is not a masterpiece. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I think putting but... masterpiece in any open like yeah. a movie just opens and you immediately call it a masterpiece. I think that's kind of overselling it in a big yeah. way because it typically takes more than one watch to really absorb yep. the film and to finally say, this is a fucking masterpiece. It is a movie yeah. that I would like to see more than once though. I, I would like to go back and see us Absolutely. again, because like you said, you know, it's funny for me. I, it was that South by Southwest screening. Everybody loved it. You know how these screenings go, Travis, because you and right. I have been, have been part of them, right? We were the, we, you and I sat together at the first screening of get out at Sundance, yep. the midnight screening. Yeah. Um, and you know, people sometimes I think get carried away a little bit in their praise. I think for get out, it was probably worth it. Us maybe not as much, but you know when I when I saw it, I I was much more mixed than a lot of the critics were. I still liked it. I mean, I think you can't deny Peel's craft, right? And yep. and the and the and the acting as well. I mean, Lupita Nyong'o and and Winston Duke. You know, somebody wrote something about Winston Duke's performance that they had a hard time believing that it was the same actor playing the tethered version and the normal version, <laughs> and that is and that is true. I mean, he's amazing in it. He's a, it's a really good performance, and Lupita Nyong'o yep. too, and the kids. But like you said, the third act is very, very, very ambitious, and I'm not totally sure sure it worked. I mean, Paul hasn't seen it yet, and I'm sure that a lot of listeners haven't necessarily seen it yet at this point. But it it poses a lot of questions, right? Like it makes you and and there's and there's just you know if you get kind of bogged down in the minutia of it, which I did, and probably you did as mm -hmm. well, it kind of it kind of affects your enjoyment of the film. Like I saw with two people who really didn't care for it at all. And that was the problem. They got really bogged down and, you know, the rules and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, whether or not this, this would work or, or, you know, it was feasible. And I did too. And I, but anyway, I'd, I'd like to hear your take though. That's, that's tough. Uh, when you're making a movie like that, like yeah. this, where there are rules that seem like they should be followed because you you kind of box yourself into a corner as you get as you reach like the final chapters, you know the yeah. final moments. You, you you kind of bog yourself down. And I think that Peel kind of got caught up in that himself. I don't know if he'll ever admit to that or if he'll talk about that in future interviews, maybe. But it seems like that, that's what happened. And the, and that final, yeah, it's hard to talk about it without spoiling anything. But but in terms of larger issues, you know, it's kind of dealing with not just duality of man, like I think that's probably the most obvious thing, but kind of our, our overall discord in the country and how we've kind of let this thing fester ourselves. We've we've kind of taken this blase attitude towards the the problems that this country has, and it's kind of coming home to roost. You know yeah. what I mean? That's kind of the way, in, in a larger sense, it's kind of what he's what he's talking about. 
And he tries to bring these themes together in, in like one really stark image towards the end of the movie, uh, really the the final scenes of the movie. And and to me, I was just kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I'm buying that really. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm he sure spells it out. He spells it out maybe too much more than he should have. You know, like you said in your, your review originally, it's an allegory. You know, an alg- allegory. Sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm, I'm not. Alleg- allegory. Allegory. Speak Any- English. Anyway, the th- <laughs> I'm Canadian. Uh, so all these themes are over my head. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm not American. But no, but like you said, the thing is, the whole thing about the duality of man, though, and, and that aspect of it, you know, I wish that he had left it. I don't know why he felt the need to explain himself so much. I think that's what was the big problem. Like knowing how everything worked and trying to give us like kind of the nitty gritty of it. I think that that was the big problem because when he started doing that, I had too many questions afterwards. And if they had just left it like a mystery as to where the tethered come from, just the hints that, you know, Lupita Nyong'o's care, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the tethered version says when she's talking about, you know, the yep. different kind of life that they led. If he had left it at that, you know, I would have walked out thinking that was a stone cold, you know, awesome horror movie, you know, but he tries to explain it so much. And that's like, I think that's a trap that he fell into. And I think that's why reaction has been a bit mixed. Peel may ultimately be one of those directors who, who may need somebody to come in and say, Hey, you know, this might need to be edited. Yeah. This might need, he might need, he might need that, that sort of guide. I think he'd get away with it with get out because he really, all the themes that were related to that mm-hmm. movie were mostly, were mostly, race based so you can kind of get away with it i think he's reaching for more in this one and i think he needed to tone it down it, it's almost kind of the way i feel about sorry to bother you which is a movie that i really liked last year yeah. but but yeah. i also felt that 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 boots had had been building up 30 years of, of shit he wanted to talk about mm-hmm. and he tried to put it all in there mm. and it did and so it it ultimately didn't quite work as well as it might have if he had pared it down some yeah, uh, I kind of feel like Peel may be one of those things. It, he might be, it, it might end up being great for him on the Twilight Zone or something where he can kind of approach each one piece by piece. I'm very, know? very anxious to eager to see that. Um, I, I mean, fuck, I guess I have to subscribe to CBS All Access now for a month. Is he, is he directing those though? Or, is, uh, or some of them, or his... one, or at least, at least one of them, but he's, presenting... I mean, typically for an anthology, I mean, they have different, a bunch of different filmmakers. He's like so. the Rod Serling of that show though, I think. Right. Yep. So I guess he's involved creatively in a lot right. of yeah. He's like think, executive producer as which well. Which might be and, good, uh, as Travis said, because maybe he can spearhead some of those and just be involved, but then also have other voices that are informing what it becomes. So it might that might actually work a little better for, for Peel in a creative <sighs> sense. And may, who knows, maybe that'll help uh, inform him for future projects. But the other thing I was going to say is for, yeah. you know, for Get Out, when Get Out came out, you know, it was, you know, a modestly budgeted film that just like took off and it yeah. was amazing hit and then you know what you you guys know what it's like as soon as you make it big when you're a new voice emerging and then you have a massive hit they give you the world for your next yeah. film they're like whatever you want to do man just you know just make whatever the fuck you want it'll be and that's a tra- and that's a trap and i don't think that you're necessarily it is a trap. Doing, it i don't is think you're necessarily doing anybody any favors with that you know i mean he's you know i think that peel was smart about it you know he could have made a get out two just gone for the money and he didn't you know um <laughs> he made something very ambitious but it's like You know, the thing is, sometimes that works and sometimes it really doesn't. Like, a time that it really didn't work was, I don't know if you've seen Under the Silver Lake yet. That's the follow-up to It Follows from the... Of, no, nope, uh, I don't think I mean, I'm going to see it. That's I mean, that's a te- that's a disaster. I mean, that movie is a disaster, unreleasable. Oh, eight, eight, eight twenty four has dumped it. it it's an un- it came yeah. out in Canada six months ago. Eight twenty four is still sitting on it. And I'm <laughs> I have I it. have no desire. Maybe if it's on Netflix one day, I might like put it on just to like you know hit that curiosity button. But I can't say in any. It's a- I'm excited to watch it's it. It's a director that was given final cut that should have never been final cut. And the Canadian distributor, I know somebody, or I knew somebody who worked for them, and they said the big issue with it was that he had final cut and he would not cut a frame out of the movie, even after it was hated at Cannes. I just don't know how to... It's so crazy how some of these guys get final cut. And Richard Kelly too. That was the same thing that happened with Richard oh Kelly God. after Donnie, oh, Donnie, 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 Donnie Darko. You know, I mean, it was, you know, and the thing is, Peel, you know, I would say... This is more like, you know, Sh- Shamalian when he did Unbreakable. You know, he made a really good follow up. But my issue, though, with Peel is that, like, I hope he's the kind of director that, you know, 
people are kind of pigeonholing him and calling him the new Hitchcock and stuff like that. And they did the same thing to Shamalian and, and it worked out, it worked out well enough for him, but in the end, I guess after some bad years, but I'd, I'd kind of like to see Peel, you know, do something like tackle another genre now. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. he's done really well at horror, maybe do an adventure movie or maybe do like, you know, a drama or something like he could totally do it. And he's, I'd he's love to see him do a romance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why not? There's been a, a really good, African American led romance movie yeah. in a long time. We get we get crappy thrillers all the time. Sure. <laughs> you, you know, with the <laughs> Megan with Megan Good and Omari Hardwick or something. Hey, we don't get, I love you Megan. You're always picking, you're you're always picking awesome. on Omari Hardwick. You better every fucking time, every that. time I see you, you you somehow work in a how much you hate Omari Hardwick thing. I don't What's like Omari Hardwick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But we get those movies all the time, but I'd love to see a good romance, like a like a yeah. loving basketball type romance that we haven't had in a long time. Sure, uh, I'd love like, to see like Ghost straight attack romance or rom com, you know, like a straight romance. You yeah. know, we just haven't had a good one. Travis, uh, we like because we do get we get rom coms too. You know, sure. uh, but we don't, and, and and those get those have wide appeal. But but a really good African American led romance is something yeah. that is missing and i think there'd be a big audience for that um of especially course. if somebody comes at it with a with a unique voice like peel has so yeah well and his movies do kind of cross boundaries too i mean that's the thing i mean you know when i saw us it was about yeah it's you know, not i mean it's it's, it's, it's montreal so it was like going to see an 80 percent caucasian audience when i when i saw it and they all loved it i mean that's just that it's the yeah. demographic of montreal it's, which and is, I mean, I would, I would absolutely go see Jordan. You know, Jordan Peele does a black romance movie. I'd, I'd love to see that. You know, I'm sure it'd be great. You know, I well, mean, that's a great thing about Peele at this point yeah. is he has he's established. Listen, he already comes from uh, you know Key and Peele, which is you know, it's hilarious. It's great. It's like one of the best comedy shows ever. He doesn't need he's to necessarily do a comedy though because he's already kind of got that. You know, right? I mean, but that's, I'm saying he's. But I'm yeah. saying he has that. He's established himself there, and he's now established himself as a filmmaker. Yeah. Like a yep. serious filmmaker, and now like with the Twilight Zone, like he's kind of he can write his own ticket in terms of whatever what he wanted to make, whatever kind of genre he wanted to do. Maybe oh, he wanted like straight action movie. Like that's he could probably he could get that made. He could do well, God, especially stuff. after Us's opening weekend. I think he can get whatever he wants made. I yeah. think he can trust get me. A... <laughs> I'm, sure his, I'm sure his phone is ringing off the hook this weekend. Yeah. Believe me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right. uh, Jordan. Hey. Like I guarantee you, people probably throwing projects at him left and right. But I hope that Peel is. I hope he sticks to his guns, and doesn't get in outside. You know, get that outside influence or pressure to do something that he's not really into. Uh, I just I hate that. Like that happens all the time. You see it. You know, they're like, "Hey, he's a great voice. Let's have him direct like a Marvel or a DC movie or do something here or do something there." It's like, no. Like I would like to see Peel kind of go the Nolan route and just like stay true to himself and just. Do I think he the- will though. I mean, he I seems think he like will too, but I'm just, yeah. You know, but they're like, hey, here, do probably like him. Doing maybe I, I see him maybe trying to do maybe an original superhero character, yeah. something along those lines. I, I mean, I, I'm with it's, you. I don't want to see him jump into some like big franchise or something. Yeah, like uh, I mean, like he's he gets hired. Twilight to do. Zone, so there. Right. Yep. It's scratched. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have to say I'd be disappointed if Jordan Peele signed on to do like Doctor Strange two or something like that. You know, uh, so, like. Uh, what about yeah. Jordan Peele's Blade? Uh, that would um, be pretty cool, though. I would kind of interesting. That would I be would, interesting. I would take a Jordan Peele Blade because you know, again, he can un- he understands that from multiple facets. That would be mm-hmm. and that the only would, thing that, about that, that, that self take right there. Only thing about that, if you're going to do a Blade movie, I'm telling you, it has to be Wesley Snipes, man. I'm telling well, you, I think the plan is it. already to do that is to have yeah. Snipes as Blade, but then have like his daughter. Or, uh, you know, like a, a protege that he's training to be like the next generation blade. Probably they would work together. Because, I mean, he's so still, think, like, Snipes, Snipes can still do it. Oh, oh fuck, yeah. Snipes, Snipes, Snipes can still do it. Night Stalkers, uh, Ryan Reynolds and... and, and uh, oh, God, yeah. Oh, that worked yeah. out great. He's too expensive now. Yeah, They'd never beautiful. get Reynolds. Of course yeah. not. <laughs> but, yeah, I agree. I hope they bring back Wesley Snipes to do Blade. I can't... I, mean, I say I can't see anybody else being Blade, but... Uh, I really can't see anybody else being blamed. No, it's <laughs> hard to it's, imagine. Uh, it's pretty, I mean, he's pretty well established. I mean, he just owned that role so well. It's hard to see anybody but Snipes. And he's totally game. He's said it multiple times on Twitter. He's like, fucking call me. Still, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, he's not working a heck of a lot beyond yeah. that. I mean, he yeah, no. probably would, probably would want to come back to it. Um, sure. I, so I guess we don't want, we don't want sticky fingers coming back as Blade, right? We don't want, nobody <laughs> wants that. 
Okay. Uh, hey, I like that series. I still own that series. It was, it was actually pretty good. Um, but uh, but yeah, we definitely want Wesley. But yeah, uh, Jordan Peele taking on like a an original superhero thing is something I could see if he's not going to work. I mean, one of the good things about Marvel is they kind of it, it, for certain filmmakers they kind of let their their aesthetic stand out. You know, kind of like Ryan Coogler. He it, that movie wouldn't have been the same if it was any other filmmaker. Um, you know, Taika td for thor rat and rocket wouldn't have been the same with any other filmmaker they're pretty good at letting yeah. their directors um you know for certain directors you know well the director directors have that kind of style have- if you hire alan taylor you're going to get boring old alan taylor yeah but if you bring in somebody who has a certain style marvel's pretty good at, at matching up directors with the right projects yeah they are you know, so. well we still have you travis uh seeing as how we only have a limited time with you because you're in demand and, and ryan Flick. You're so uh, popular, Travis. Uh, You're so popular. I'd like to talk about actually Dragged Across Concrete because that's a movie that we've all seen, and I, I know I know you really liked it, right, Travis? I did. I did like. It. I liked it. So we all, I, we all liked it. Yeah. At first, if I was going to, I, at the first few minutes, I was I wasn't oh, quite sure. The first hour go. for me. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could honestly easily cut out the first hour minus a few small scenes, and you wouldn't miss anything. Well, no, I don't know. I mean, it does. I think it does a really good job, kind of planting the seeds, though, a little bit. It's like just, I, it's way too slow burn. I think that's the problem, and I, and I know that was the intention. Uh, for it to be kind of a slow burn thriller in that sense to do and there's a lot of setup that some of it pays off and some of it is just kind of like oh you set that up just to shock us i gotcha you know um and i understand it's like i kind of i understand what he was doing and why he was doing that so that you feel the impact of some of this stuff but some of it felt just almost a little too excessive or self-serving in a way Mm -hmm. um but overall like by the time it was over i was still wrestling with like what i felt overall but there was so much that i enjoyed and so much that i was like man that's just fucked up or that's like really just that's crazy that's wild and i was even though it was like really slow burn thriller i still felt kind of edge of my seat because i did care what happened to these horrible people and let's be clear every one of these people is basically not a good person it's yeah. like basically the it's like who is the best of the worst? Well, there's there's it's, one there's one. I mean, I don't want to get into spoilers because it, it's not out in Canada yet, and I know we do have a, a bunch of Canadian listeners. So, uh, hey. but but the thing is, there's one there's one character in the movie that's a good person, and that, that person has a really horrible fate. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and that's and the setup that I was talking about, where they spend like such a long scene to let you know, like. Hey, look at how great this person is! And oh, but that is a great. That is a really great payoff, though. I have to say that really kind of. I was taken aback by that, though, and that almost kind of pulled me into the movie. I'm like, oh shit, anything can happen now. But you know what? Had they cut the scene, the setup scene that leads right into that, I think it still would have had impact of that person. You know, when they were returning to where they were returning to, trying not to yeah. <laughs> really teetering on spoilers here. Yeah, but it it still would have had that same impact. I think. I yeah. mean. It's, it's, still, it's, still it's, it's, a known, it's a known actress who has, mm-hmm. you know, worked with with this filmmaker before. So you can't you, when, you know, when that person comes in, you're like, oh, OK, this is another major character to introducing here. And it's yeah, and it was out. late in the game, too. Really? Maybe. I yeah. mean, and it's a shocking moment, too. Like, I yeah, remember it is, watching sure. it and I felt bad, too, because it's the one character in the movie that is legitimately a good person, you know, or at least seems to be a good person. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's the, but that's the, the other thing about Drag Across Concrete, though, is that you could say they're bad people, but, you know, nobody's. Well, I mean, the, okay, the bad, the, the bank robbers are fucking evil. I mean, they're yeah, just they're like pure evil. evil. Totally. Evil. There's there's Evil. there's levels of terribleness in this movie. Yes. Right? So well, that's, that's what like, I mean. There's like that, you go from the those guys, the the robbers that are just like at peak evil pieces of shit, and then you go down to the lowest level, who I would argue, you know, is they're bad and they're still evil, but they're well, I would say they're bad, not evil. Well, I think what, that's what, what he does out. is what he does is he kind of and this is the thing I, I I think I mentioned it in my review. I hope I did anyway. Is that is that w- what he does is he kind of humanizes them. So so in the case yeah. of yeah, Mel yeah. Gibson and Vince Vaughn's of his characters, like they're they're bad people. They're racist. They're 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 corrupt. They they abuse their power as cops. You know, so they're bad people. 
But then you go and you look at their home life and Mel Gibson's character's got these things that are going on with his family that you see. They, these are all people trying to get out of something. Like they're yeah. trying to yeah, get yeah. away. They're trying to improve their stations of, in life and they're, and they're doing it the wrong way. They're, uh, uh, un, they're undoubtedly, they're doing it the wrong way. But we Wait, see that's what not what you're supposed to do? No, yeah. it's really not. And, <laughs> well, they thought like, it was just going to be a nice drug ripoff. Steal gold bullion. <laughs> well, they thought it was just going to be a nice drug ripoff, but unfortunately it got to be a little bit more complicated. But it's the same thing, you know, with, with Tori Kittles and, and Michael J. White's character too, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah they're, they're criminals, but they're also trying to improve their lives. Yeah. And you know, don't, at the same time, they're, they're still implicated. They're, they're trying to I make mean, their lives are... better, not just for themselves, but for the people in their families. Like they're yeah. for others, not necessarily just for themselves. It's for other people that they're yeah. trying to improve them, improve things. So you kind of you kind of feel for them a little bit, even though you know everything they're doing is bad. <laughs> you know. Well, and I think that's like the the overall appeal. And when it was over, I was like, I found myself like wanting you know, certain characters to live. I was like, oh, I hope so-and-so lives. I hope so-and-so lives. And then it's like, you know, it's kind of like they're just snatched away from you yeah. as the film goes on. But then it, you're like, you know, I think that's kind of the the overall, you know, the the moral kind of question there is like with all these with all these guys, with all the bad things they do, could you really be satisfied with these people living and getting away with it? Well, and, and not only that, but it's also very provocative, you know, in terms of the casting. I mean, you are casting Mel Gibson, who has, you know, I mean, as much as, you know, you and I like Mel Gibson, you know, he's got some real skeletons in his closet and some things that make people, you know, kind of question what kind of person he is, right? I mean, at the very least, he has anti-Semitic and racist tendencies, you know, that we, we can argue that he was drunk. You could argue that he didn't mean it. You can argue whatever, but he does have that in him, you know, and, and, and I think it was a daring move to cast him in that role. The casting is very deliberate, I yeah. think, in this, in this case. And, and, yeah. uh, and it works. I mean, it works. Mm. This is a movie that, if you know, if you just look at film and Twitter, this movie is, is very controversial and for sure. a lot of people already just because yeah. of the casting. And, well, and, and I it, think it's, that's... It's impossible to watch it and not, and not recognize that. But at the same yeah. time, you know, uh, Zoller does a great job of giving these two actors characters that are that are more than just one thing. They yeah, are, they're nuanced. They are, they are, yeah, they are they are very complex characters, and so that you're you're watching and you like you say we're, we've we, we've all talked about how we we felt something for these characters on on more than just a you know on more than just an an, an an interest level. Like we we actually wanted to see some see some of them live. We, we were concerned about their like, their their struggles. You know, yeah. so he's done. He did a great job of really humanizing these people that we know are on the wrong side of things here. And that's something that you know that I think is you know it's pretty amazing to to be able to pull that off because it is some if it if it doesn't affect you you're probably a sociopath. <laughs> but like me watching it, like I really was conflicted mm -hmm. about you know these people living or getting away with this with you know with the crime with whatever you know whatever they're trying to get away with. You know, each person, as you know, Travis said, they all have a stake. They're all trying to do something. It's not purely just, hey, I just want to be rich and, and you know, live wealthy and, you know, live the high life. Each one feel, of them wanted to yeah. improve a situation. But at the same time, people are killed in the process. Yeah. People and money is still stolen. You know, there's like so and you're like, well, you know, uh, it really is something that you have to toil with. Like by the time the credits roll, I was like, huh, I got to think about this one. Like well, I does, really it, had to toil with it. It doesn't give you an easy, you know, an easy out, you know, and, and, I, and I think it's kind of interesting too, though, that you really do start to feel for these characters, though, the fact that they're in situations they can't escape, especially Tori Kittles and Michael J. White. You know, I mean, these guys are getaway mm -hmm. drivers, you know, they're criminals and they know that they're breaking the law, but and then that, that getaway ride, know. and was it that getaway ride like, the most tense thing in the world. Oh yeah, I, mean, I was waiting. I was were, seriously. I was waiting for a Zoller. I was waiting for a Zoller moment where, like, one oh of them just got shot in the back of the head. I yes, was waiting for that to happen because, well, like, and see they're that. waiting for it to happen too. That's what's kind of interesting about it is like they're both looking at each other, like, "What the fuck are we gonna do? These guys are insane." <laughs> you know, like, holy. Also, shit. I just want to say I was deeply offended that they are wearing white face. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, that's him being provocative again. You know, I mean, that's. Pretty but I mean, <laughs> but you know what? That's. But again, with you know, with and I'm just kidding. I'm not really offended by that. But uh, the thing about that Zoller has made with this film is what, and what I really do love about it is the fact that it doesn't present itself as standing on any one no. side. It kind of presents everything and says, "Deal with it," and that is kind of what I really like about uh, what I like about Zoller as a filmmaker, but also what yeah. I like about Drag is that. It, as you have said, it doesn't give you an easy out. It says you're going to have to deal with all of this. I'm not going to make it easy for you by saying, hey, this is what you're supposed to feel. It literally leaves it up to you. Even by stripping out the music, there's no score. So there's yeah. no music to kind of tell you how to feel or to give you any clue what's happening at any moment. And I think that helps with the suspense of the film, too, where you're just like, I have no fucking idea what's about to happen because anything could happen because there's there's no music cue that's telling me kind of like, what's happening here how you know what is the tone well, it doesn't give funny. you that it's funny the music uh so s Craig zoller wrote all the songs and they're sung by like 70s soul bands like the ah. ojs and and uh Tavares and stuff but but there's a pop song at one point that vince vaughn's character is making fun of that's actually sung by s craig zoller <laughs> yeah <laughs> so hey, can cool. we get zoller to title every single movie that <laughs> know, right He's got three movies with like amazing titles. Like, oh God! Oh God! Okay, so the okay is is yeah, boy, he's got a new one that he's doing. I, I can't even re remember the title now, but it's uh anyway. Did he give oh, you a oh. title? Yeah, he did. Oh, but it was the, he the, said the, it. He said the rat, said the, rattle, the rattle creek one. The the the, the, the rattle. Oh no 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 no! It's something else. Oh, it's it's Eddie. Oh, hold on, oh, I'll but... I'll try to find it. I don't know. I it's Chris has failed. Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, dragged across concrete. I think it is a, it's a complex uh, watch. It's a, it's actually a pretty solid thriller. When you get to, you know, the last hour is truly edge of your seat kind of stuff. But you do have to make it through that first hour and a half. It's going to be hard for a lot of people because of the pace and because it is, you know, two and a half hours long. Um, although for me, I didn't feel it as much as I thought I was going to. Yeah, uh, I didn't. I, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't problematic. It I wasn't could, problem. Once that, that first hour is pretty slow, but I, you know, and but once it's you get slow, past but that, it still pulls you in. There's still you do get to know these characters, the, and the dialogue yeah. is fantastic in some of those stakeout scenes yeah. between Gibson and Vaughn. Well, it's, it's almost like a play. It's almost like a yeah. play. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 Really good dialogue, man. Um, uh, makes, you, makes you really want to go see that Puppet Master movie he did. That he, he oh, wrote no, that, right? no, no, it's it's actually terrible. Travis. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know, and the thing is, and the thing is, people, people, um, you know, when when people say that as Craig Zoller, you know, where they think he might be racist or something like that, like that comes from that Puppet Master movie. I mean, it's not even. I mean, the thing that I got out of the Puppet Master movie is I walked out of that thinking that he might be a Nazi or something because it seemed so anti-Semitic to me. <laughs> Then I found out that he's that he's actually Jewish, that he was born, that he was that he's like he's an atheist, but that he was born Jewish, and that kind of is like okay, well maybe he's not a Nazi then, but it was like, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, probably a movie, probably a movie. low probability that he's a Nazi if the, he's Jewish. But the anti seven, but it's like so many anti-Semitic jokes, yeah. Like Bone Tomahawk is you know whites coming after Native Americans, killing Native Americans, right? Uh, you know, then we we know what Brawl and Self Black uh, ninety nine was Vince Vaughn's character was a white what a white nationalist. Is uh, he though? You know, that's the that's the I, thing. I think he was. He? I think he was. I asked people about the 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 I you know I, I tried to I asked Vince Vaughn what the tattoo meant and you know nobody was like oh they're like you know we we try not to say is it a white nationalist so uh, we tried to I, don't, I didn't get that impression I, because he didn't he wasn't a rhetoric kind of guy. If you're a white nationalist, you're gonna have a lot of rhetoric. But he was very soft spoken. Like he, he he spoke with his actions more than anything. Well, I felt maybe he was a reformed white nationalist, like he was kind of trying to leave it behind. But he had a big fucking tattoo it's, it's, in the back of his head. Possible. Yeah, yeah. It, it's possible he was. Maybe. But but maybe. but I think this. I think to me the symbolism was pretty clear. But yeah. But uh, but 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 regardless, that's how a lot of people took it. And mm -hmm. then you have this movie where the characters are, you know, who they are. So I mean, yeah. I, I get why people you think certain things about Zoller, but I think Zoller's being is, is trying to make you, it's, just, it's trying to blur the lines for people and make yeah. you consider things and think about things. And well, yeah, I, I think that's his thing is he, he puts it out there. He makes, yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what he said when I interviewed him. I'm going to play the clip a little bit later, but that's pretty much exactly what he said. And he said that, you know, politically you can think about him, whatever you want, but he doesn't consider himself a political person. You know I mean? It's not, 
You know, I mean, the thing is, though, also, you know, if you look back at he's influenced by movies from the 70s, you know, and, and yeah. if oh, you yeah. look back, the, 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 the protagonists in those movies were very complicated. You know, Popeye Doyle in French Connection is a racist, you know, and, and it's just you, you, you can kind of, you know, it was a different era. And I think that's he's trying to be like those directors. And, and I think it's good that we have filmmakers who are willing to make movies like this because, you know, big studios don't want to make characters like no. that anymore. They don't no. want to make complicated characters you're going to make nope. vanilla characters <clears throat> and i'm glad that filmmakers like zoll are out there trying to make you think about the people you're watching and you yeah know, so that that's good to me so if you want to keep making movies about you know maybe bad people maybe complicated people whatever complex people then i'm all for it well, well you, know, you know and that's true. a reflection yeah. of people that is you know that's who we are none of us uh <laughs> you know are, have clean hands like we are all complex people you know there's no there's no black and white it's gray everybody's gray we all have you know we have faults we have failings and we have great things about us as well but Thank that's the yourself. thing is we we <laughs> yeah. we run on a spectrum you know that's how people are and i think that's interesting and it's i think it's necessary because I think film, truly, it speaks to the human experience. It, it, is, it is one of the highest forms of art of us expressing our humanity. And, you know, you can express it in a mythological way as, you know, showing superheroes just kind of doing good and having very small moral issues. Or you could take something like Dragged Across Concrete, where you really have to face all the different variables that is humanity and being a human being on this planet. And in this situation, you know, these guys are you know on one very extreme side there. But you're still getting a broader picture of characters, you know. Of uh, course, you characters. are also going to get a movie that's going to launch a million think pieces, though. I mean, it's already begun. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's funny. The last time a, a mainstream studio did a complicated character was was three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. And remember how many think pieces we got about about Sam Rockwell's character and how, oh, this movie shouldn't be nominated for Best Picture because he's a racist character that, you know, tries to come around at the end. And it's, so People dumb. don't like. Yeah, people so seem not dumb. to like anything that's complicated. <laughs> they want everything so they want everything so simple and spoon fed to them, and it's you know. I mean, the best characters, yeah. you know, they win Oscars. Denzel Washington won for Training Day. Heath Ledger won for Dark Knight. I mean, there's like the best characters are complex, typically not good characters that just pull you in because part of you relates to these characters you know yeah. either you think you may think oh they're just really cool but there's also like a deeply embedded truth in a lot of these characters too they've just kind of they've gone off the deep end in a in a negative direction but they still it's like there's a center there with those characters that you can relate to and they just chose a different path that took them on the, on the you know the wrong way but there's still something there you're like yeah, I can see that. I can see it. You can relate to it up to a point, you know. Not in Canada. We're perfect. Not in Canada. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You just can't Sorry. you just can't say the word allegory right. That's all. <laughs> they, don't speak, they don't speak very good English. <laughs> allegory? <laughs> no. Um allegory. Yeah, say ramp say ra say rampage, Paul. Say rampage. 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 <laughs> rampage. <laughs> rampage. Hey, so we still have we still have Travis for a few minutes. You know what I'd like I'd love to talk, to get your take on Travis is um so the trailer for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood dropped this week. And I, I don't know about you guys, but for me that's my number one most anticipated movie of the year. And it's set in, you know, 1969 and what people aren't really saying everybody's getting kind of bogged down with the Manson murders and I'm sure that'll be part of the movie obviously because there's an actor playing Manson, an actress playing Sharon Tate, Margot Robbie. Um but what's interesting is that he's also influenced by this book called The Studio by John Gregory Dunn. And it's a book that I've read actually a couple of times that I really like, which is kind of an interesting bird's eye view of what Hollywood was like at that time. Because it was an interesting year because you were going from kind of the old studio system, the hippy dippy love child stuff to like the auteurs of the 70s. And I think it's an era that he's really interested in. And I think the movie is going to have a very kind of broad scope to it. I mean, I'm not even sure how they're going to handle the murders, to be honest, but I wanted to get your take on it, Travis, the trailer, what I, you thought of it. I saw some people that were actually kind of upset, and this is one of the comments that I, that I responded to on Twitter uh, from a, 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 a colleague and who was, who, was, who was upset that they had made a movie uh, with Sharon Tate in it, and yet it still was about men. And I was like, you know, I was like, you know, uh, I don't think Sharon Tate is going to be like a major factor in the movie. Like, I don't yeah. the way I'm the way I'm reading it, the whole Manson murder stuff is probably going to be in the background because yeah. that stuff had, 
had an effect on everything at that time. It was is part of the of society's yeah. sweeping changes. You know, it makes yeah. me think and of how Summer of Sam was handled in Summer of yeah. Sam. Exactly, and that's the way I, I, I'm perceiving it now. Tarantino yeah. could totally do something different, and we're just missing it. But that's the way I'm perceiving it. So that I mean, so I, I, I'm looking at this as more of an exploration of, of Hollywood at that time, an era that I will freely admit I don't know nearly enough about. And I'm hoping that we can get more, that I can get some perspective, the Tarantino perspective on that era. It's interesting. I, I was just at a Tarantino retrospective last night. They've been doing one all week here. What and uh, so I watched, uh, you know, last night I watched uh, both, they showed both Kill Bills back to back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Fuck are yeah. my two favorite uh, Tarantino movies. I am really? not this Tarantino nice. fan in the world. I like him, but I don't love him. Um, but I adore the Kill Bill movies, and I think Same. I had a and it, yeah. And I, I was I was happy because the place was packed. Yeah. Oh and man, so, that'd be fun to see so, those. Yeah, man. And they were showing in Glorious Bastards right after it. I just couldn't stay for it. And the play, and then when I went out, when I left, the line was double. Like it was like there were even more people coming uh, to see uh, Glorious Bastards. People are excited I, to see a Tarantino yeah. movie, you know. And I'd love to see him do that that ultimate cut of Kill Bill, you know, where, where oh, it's God, together yeah. as one movie. Um. You know, there's got to be a ton of stuff, too, on the cutting room floor. Gosh, for me, though, Tarantino, it, uh-huh. I still really love the early stuff. You know, I mean, I saw I, I at Sundance, I got to see that Reservoir Dog screening when that he was there for the 35. Were you there for that, Travis? I wasn't. I was yeah. not there. for. And yeah. uh, and I love Pulp Fiction. I mean, Pulp Fiction is one of my favorite movies of all time. You know, yeah. but, but it got it. It's, a, it's such an event for me, though. Anytime Tarantino does a movie and uh, I, can we talk about uh, Mike Moe as Bruce Lee? I think to me that he awesome. stole the trailer. I mean, yeah, I was I, his Absolutely. impression was so perfect and like spot on that I, I seriously, I was like, I felt like I was really watching Bruce watching Lee, like Bruce come Lee. back from yeah. the dead. I was like, yeah. that you, you like amazing. Something you referenced something about that that he was drawing, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, okay. That so, caught, that yeah, caught my attention that I wanted to ask you about. People okay, so people were kind of pissed off at the at the trailer because they thought it was like making fun of Bruce Lee and 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 uh, the fact that, that and the fact all. and the fact that he was fighting Brad Pitt and stuff like that. First of all, I mean Brad, Bruce Lee. If you watch any behind the scenes footage, Bruce Lee, that is the way he talked. He was like that, that. is exactly how he, he gave talked. he gave a, a famous interview on Canadian TV where he where pretty much those lines were taken directly from it. You know, I am registered as a lethal weapon, like that kind of thing, and. Yeah. You know, and, and Brad Pitt's taking the piss out of him. But, you know, the thing is, and then they're fighting. The thing is, Bruce Lee knew Sharon Tate because Sharon Tate did a movie before she died called The Wrecking Crew, which was a, a Matt, which was a Dean Martin, Matt Helm movie, like a James Bond ripoff. Right. Very cheesy. And uh, Bruce Lee choreographed the fights for it. And if you watch that movie, one of the stuntmen is Chuck Norris. And that was because Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee were really tight at the time. Uh-huh. And Bruce Lee was famous at that time for being um, a teacher, like one of the best martial arts teachers in Hollywood. He taught Steve McQueen, James Coburn, all the really big stars in the late 60s. And he was a pallbearer at, at Sharon Tate's funeral as well. So he was kind of related a little bit to what was happening. And that fight scene, though, that he's doing with, um, with Brad Pitt, they're for sure doing a fight out of the wrecking crew. Where he, where, uh, where he's, you know, they're, and they're going through moves because they're both wearing sparring gloves. Like it's obvious that they're doing some yeah. kind of choreography. It's not a real fight. Like it's not a kung fu movie. They're, you know, and Brad right. Pitt's character is a stuntman. <laughs> Brad Pitt's character is a stuntman. Stunt but, man, well, course, Brad yeah. Pitt's character also is not based on a real person. It's no. not a real person. So but I think, to get I think offended that by that. But here's the other thing about Bruce Lee that you have to take into account. Bruce Lee, as a martial artist, was constantly challenged throughout yes. his life. All the time, if you, I've, I've read his, I, I, trust me, I, I used to take Jeet Kune Do back in yeah. the day, and I've studied Bruce Lee. And the thing is, this used to, this was part of his life, like getting in fights. Like he would just go out in public, and people would come up and challenge him all the time because everybody wanted. He, he was the guy to unseat, and a lot of like one of the challenges, people would walk up and they what they do is they tap their feet, and that was like their it was a challenge, and he couldn't turn them down. And Bruce Lee was constantly getting in these little little scraps and shit like that. So seeing you know a couple guys sitting on a back lot talking shit, and then getting into a brawl, whether it's real or you know choreographed, whatever the case may be, is not unheard of. Yeah. So 
It's not some perfect world where, oh, Bruce Lee would never get in a fight with somebody. Why the fuck not? Yeah, Bruce, Lee, Bruce was Lee actually was actually pretty prone to fisticuffs, too, though. If you watch yeah, him, he was well, kind of a badass guy. He wasn't Mr. He was not a turn the other cheek kind of guy. No, no, no. But, and that's <laughs> the thing is Bruce Lee was very much about demonstrating. Yeah, if because he wanted he to fight him, he would fight arts. you. Bruce yeah. Lee changed martial <laughs> yeah. arts. He created Jeet Kune Do. Because he felt that what what martial arts was that he had learned traditional, it was it was too restricting, and that was what Jeet Kune Do created. That's or that's what he created with uh, with Jeet Kune Do was an answer to that, and you know he got a lot of flack from that from the martial arts community, from the the you know the Chinese rooted martial arts community. They were not happy about that, and they were not happy that he was teaching you know Americans that shit. And they if you like don't, that. and if you don't want to see. A truthful account of that movie, you should watch Birth of the Dragon, which tells a total bullshit story about Bruce Lee <laughs> and makes it and like Billy Magnuson in it or something like as, that. As Steve McQueen, he's Steve McQueen. <laughs> they reveal that at the end of the movie, which makes no sense because the time period I, is I so off. Know, I, I, I totally did not know that until you just said that. It's set in 1968, and they've got Steve McQueen as like a homeless guy. <laughs> He was making. He had already made the Great Escape and Bullet at that point. He was the most <laughs> biggest star in Hollywood. Damian Lewis is playing Steve McQueen in, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh my god! For all because Steve McQueen was invited to dinner. Was invited to dinner the night the Manson family attacked Sharon Tate. Have you guys ever read Helter Skelter? No. I well, I have. Well, I have. And well, uh, he was. Have he was. Tell he you. was. He was invited, and and Steve McQueen was like a big cokehead at the time, and he got so paranoid after the Manson murder. That he he carried around a gun with him everywhere he went, or multiple guns. So, but you know the thing about Tarantino movies, though, this is the same guy who had you know Jewish soldiers kill Hitler at the end of Inglorious Bastards. So, for all we know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood could end with Bruce Lee beating up the Manson family. Well, and see that is my <laughs> who knows. But see, that's my theory is you have two fictional characters. Yeah. In a real life Hollywood setting, I feel like this is going to be kind of another revisionist history kind yeah. of movie. I feel like it's going to be very much like Inglorious Bastards because Inglorious Bastards is all, it's all, it's not based on anything, you yeah. know, not factual. And, but it's still a very compelling watch. Uh, and I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is going to be the same thing. I, think I mean, the, the title right there, Once Upon a Time, it's a, ho- it's a fairy tale. It's a, it's a fable. Yeah, exactly. So I think that he could, it's basically going to be, uh, this is what I think, not what I know. I think it's going to be something that cherry picks aspects of that era and then just completely just fucks with, you know, the events, almost like an alternate universe kind of thing of that. Yeah, I could be totally wrong, but Tarantino. that's my that's my feeling. Yeah, it's going to be another Tarantino uh, fictional account of history, you know, just like Inglourious yeah. Bastards was. And, and that's fine. I want that sort of thing from him. That's what I, you're watching I, it for. Yeah, I want that sort of heightened, heightened uh, sense of history from him. I want that. So I, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this too, just like uh, a lot of people are. It, it, I think that at this point we can say, we can say that Tarantino is probably more of a niche than anything else at this point. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like, like that yeah. in, in in Django Unchained too. It's like, what would happen if Shaft walked into like the yeah, the exactly. Stadium? Yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. No? yeah it's, it's it's a fairy tale, but it's, it's like, a it's a highly like, enjoyable one. And if you like Tarantino, you're going to want to see this. And I think everybody else will will politely ignore it. Okay. You know, actually, actually, let me take that back. Most people will not politely ignore it. They will yeah. talk <laughs> trash about it and then and, and, and act as if they saw it when they didn't. They'll sit yeah. around. And they'll, they'll say, how many times did he say nigger in the movie? And they'll go write th- think pieces about it, but they won't actually go watch the movie. And that's how many right. how many of our how many of our peers have already made up their minds about the movie and have already written Far things too many. about one spot time in Hollywood? Without Art. seeing anything more than a 90 second trailer, they've already passed a judgment on the film. It's, it's like I told you that that one person who's like, Why is he making a movie about Sharon Tate? That's about men. And I'm like, You haven't seen the movie. First <laughs> off, I, 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 I know exactly. It. I know exactly who you're talking about. Too. First off, who <laughs> says, Who the fuck says it's even about Sharon Tate? Just because Margaret not, Robbie's playing Sharon exactly. Tate. Who the fuck? She's not, she has one side poster, but the main stars are Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio, two of those dastardly old men. But listen, Nobody in any way, there's no press release that says this is actually the Sharon Tate story, but we have Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio on the cover of the poster. That's not if you want to get mad about a Sharon Tate movie, get mad about the Hillary Duff haunting of Sharon Tate movie that's coming out. I mean, that's pure exploitation sleaze. You know, I mean, if you want to get mad about one of those movies, get mad about that one. Don't get mad about what Tarantino is doing because we don't know what he's doing. It might be God. It might be the most respectful movie ever. I mean, who knows? I mean, we'll see. 
We live in an era of complete identity politics where people will just take whatever and they'll just try and shift it into something that they think will get headlines or spin the news. So I don't even think they're even thinking about the movie in any real rational way. They're just looking for a spin, they're looking for a headline. You know, Tarantino's movie is going to be what it's going to be. You know, it's it's fucking Tarantino. He's demonstrated at this point what kind of films you can expect from him. I don't think he's going to break from that uh, with Once Upon a Time. It's going to be more of what he does. And that's a great thing. And the other other thing that's interesting is Tarantino movies, as great as they are, typically, they're not huge box office hits. Oh, I don't know. They've been they've been pretty big lately. I mean, Django Unchained, I think, made something like 400 million worldwide. And and, and so did did Glorious Bastards. For R rated original movies, I think they do pretty well. I mean, I mean, they're they're not billion dollars. They're not phenoms. They're not like, oh, my, they're not, they're not superhero movies. They make some money, but they're not like, you know, huge epic, like, oh my God, just fucking burn the box well, office. What was that you were saying, Travis? His his movies don't make that much. Not no. really. I mean, Hateful Eight made $150 million worldwide. I mean, that's not that's not that much. For a, for a for a three for a three hour Western chamber drama though, I mean it did pretty well. He has his he has an that, audience. But that's also but that's also my point. He's a he's yeah. a niche filmmaker. He's yeah. making if you if you're a Tarantino fan, then you're going to rush out and see his movies. Oh, yeah. But there's only but so many of us out there. Yes, yeah. we love him. We may love him, may love or, or see his movies as events. But yeah. there's no casual viewer who's like, I need to go see that Tarantino movie. Like no. that person is, does not exist. Like all those people that were at the retrospective with me last night, they'll be there for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. For sure. Will anybody else be there for it? Probably not. Well, yeah, and you so, got to think about who's that going to appeal to. I think DiCaprio brings in a specific audience, for one thing. Uh-huh. I think Brad Pitt's star has kind of faded in many ways, where his name isn't so much the biggest draw, like yeah. a box office draw. He's just kind of a name at this point. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't, I don't see the casual, you know, movie watcher being like, oh, what, oh, okay. I yeah, could see this being a, one of his bigger hits, though, because it's got that cast and it's also coming out in the summertime. And I think it's coming out at a point, you know, when you're not going to have a lot of, you know, adult, you know, non superhero, non kind of event movie type things coming out. So I think it's going to stand out from the pack. It's going to be quite different. So I would imagine that this will do better than, you know, I mean, Hateful Eight also came out at Christmas time, too. That was a bad time for it to come out. It was a bad time for that to come yeah. out. Yeah. So it could potentially be i think one of his bigger movies travis have you got know, a, have you got a few more minutes? Out, i don't know man this is coming out in july that's yeah. spider-man homecoming time i, I don't spider-man far from home time i don't know man i i have yeah i have a bad feeling that this that this will be a good movie that does Nobody not make any money that really? I, I i tend to agree i don't i don't think it's gonna be i don't think it's gonna be huge i think it's gonna be one of his bigger hits i don't think and it's I, gonna be a billion dollars but i think it'll be one of his bigger hits just, I don't think there's a desire to see another take on old Hollywood. I mean, we've we've seen that time and time again. Well, and the uh, other thing too is not done by Tarantino, though, yeah, but not just, done by Tarantino. Yeah, but you got to think. But what, what do people Tarantino know? Has Tarantino a, has a finite audience. I mean, that's that's the thing. Sure. I just I just I just don't see it. If he made like a and Tarantino's never going to do this. If he made like a, a like a overtly mainstream movie, it, maybe I would change my tune on that. But he's not, and Tarantino, yeah. and we would want tarantino to do that no so i mean so i just don't see it this may be i think this movie does at best close to what the hateful eight does and it may not even do that i think the summertime really? actually might hurt it really so yeah i'm, I'm just i'm 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 down on it being a, a hit movie i'm not down on it being a good movie i think it yeah. probably will be a lot of fun I just, I just have my, my doubts that it'll do much at the box office. Yeah, I think it'll go. I don't. I think it'll do over a hundred domestic, but I think that it'll be over the long haul. Yeah. I don't know about, but I don't know about worldwide because, like worldwide, what do they care about old Hollywood? That's my. Yeah. That's kind of the big. Like uh, here in the states, <laughs> sure, people are like into it, but how much appeal does that have to a Chinese audience? His you movies know? have never really been big draws overseas, no. as far as I can remember. Yeah. And I think that's and I think that's where because he's very much an American filmmaker. You know, he's I not trying to like. Did Django get pulled <clears throat> from China? Released to like fifteen minutes into the screening or something weird like I that. I think so. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. I mean, yeah. anyway, do you have a few more minutes, Travis, or do you have? To yeah, go? I got. I got a couple more minutes, and I got to split. But yeah, uh, so. I want. So okay. So wh- why don't we talk about Shazam then? Oh, let's do that. Well, let's talk about it.
So <laughs> I've said my piece, and I'll 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 reinforce it. I, can, I, I know say. I heard that Chris hates fun, so we'll let him go. <laughs> I don't hate fun. Look, okay, I saw. So Chris Paul has, Paul's been talking the last couple of weeks about how much he loved Shazam because he was on the junk. Absolutely loved it. He had a great got, time with it. I got and, paid off. Yeah, he got yeah, lots. Yeah, he got paid in cocaine. He got paid in cocaine. I know. Uh, don't but worry. You know, some some dickhead on on the Joblo Twitter said that my review was a result of uh, getting access. I mean, whatever. I mean, it's just it's just you know people are always going to say that, Paul. I mean, that's that's yeah. the thing. They just they, as soon as you get the a, nature a, of a the good beast phrase, it's always going to be. Yeah. Oh, anytime, anytime. You know, it's the you know the same thing. People were really mad about my the dirt review. Apparently, like we're like, oh, you're an asshole because you liked it. Oh, because I said that you know that if I I because of one line in my review because in the review I wrote that. You know, you could say that they were assholes and stuff like that. But if I had the same amount of access to drugs and women, I'd probably be an asshole, too. And some people like, no, I wouldn't be an asshole. And it's like, fuck off. You yeah, they would. Yeah, you're going to be a rock star. You're going to be a fucking rock star. You yeah. saw and in the movie, you see how miserable they are when they go sober. It's like, yeah. So that's <laughs> a good movie then to her. Because I, did, I didn't like that. I didn't like that first trailer they put out. Um, but, but it's a good movie, though. The dirt. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. I had a good time with it. It's not a masterpiece, but I had a good time. But let's talk about Shazam. So anyway, I so yeah, I got to see one of the early screenings, right? That they had yesterday, or it was the the Saturday afternoon screenings, and uh, there was one at four, and there was one at seven. The seven o'clock sold out, but the four o'clock wasn't. And uh, I went to see it high off of Paul's praise because Paul said he loved it, and also said he'd fire me from Joe Blow if I didn't like it. That's not true. <laughs> no, that's a lot. You know, if you do fire him, Paul, you know I write a lot of reviews. Yeah, I was just waiting, waiting in the wings. And I do, I do need more people of color, so Chris and he and, he and he loved Shazam. But anyway, but uh, Chris, so, you're fired. Anyway, um, so so anyway though. Oh man, okay. <laughs> so it's so it's the beard and the black now, I guess. The beard and the black. <laughs> so glad Travis came on this week. We can just make this transition always, nice and smooth. You know, I can always shave my head. Yeah. <laughs> but go God. ahead, man. Talk about your Shazam review. Bro. Who Talk needs me Shazam. anymore? <laughs> no, anyway, well, anyway, so I, I went to see, look. I went to see it, and I did like it. Okay, I I think I I you know you people may have misinterpreted my tweet last night. Um. It's not that I didn't like it. I liked it. I just, I wasn't as crazy about it as Paul was. Because, Paul, I know you really, really liked it. Um, you know, I'm also a comic book nerd, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, you know I'm not. And, and, and I do find that, for me, a, a certain superhero fatigue has set in a little bit. You know, it's gotten to the point that, you know, the, the familiar beats, you know, when a superhero discovers his power. It's like, I'm just getting very bored with watching that scene. You know, and I, I felt the same way, truthfully. Well, what other, what other movie did you see that but in? there's. There's no, okay to be fair. There's there's never been a discovering your power scene quite like the way Shazam does it. No, like but it. there's no but, there's no other superhero movie like Shazam. I just Name feel, it. you know, I do feel like I've seen it before though. That's the thing. I mean, it was in what movie? I just feel that I've it's this it's a superhero movie. It's it's you know it's a superhero discovering their powers, having conflict. You know, it's any origin superhero story. I mean, yeah, it's it's a superhero story meets big, and they had some nods to big, and that was and that was fine. And I didn't, you know, it's weird. I. I, I'll say this. I liked the stuff about him as a kid with the family more than I liked the superhero stuff, which is weird because I thought it was going to be the opposite. You know, um, I, I I mean, I think the casting was good. I thought all the kids were great. I liked Zachary Levy. I liked I liked the, the, Levi? the yeah, Levi. I liked <laughs> I liked the rest of, uh, you know, the the the, the, gr the grown up doppelgangers and whatever, what have you. And yeah, but the whole all the stuff with Mark I Strong, I just spoiled them. No, but all, them, all this <laughs> stuff with Mark Strong though was kind of you know a little bit. Eh. It okay. went on too. It went on too long. It was you know two hours and fifteen minutes. I, it felt long to me. It felt like it could have been a half hour shorter. And I really liked Aquaman. And Aquaman was long, but it didn't have the energy for me that Aquaman had. However, there were things about it that I really liked. I mean, I liked. You know, like you said in your review, there were some really dark moments, and I liked the dark moments because those kind of yeah. took me surprised a little bit. And I was, oh yeah, but I mean, they were like genuinely dark. I mean, they yeah, were, like, oh, absolutely, monsters yeah, yeah. biting off heads and shit. yeah, 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 yeah. And it was, and you know, and and I really liked that aspect of it, and I liked you know the relationship between the characters. I liked the actors. I I, I liked it more than I disliked it, but. I have to say, I was kind of shifting around a little bit in my seat at certain points, and you know, and and I and it did feel very familiar to me. I mean, I know you guys 
also are bigger superhero and comic book fans than I am. I mean, I'm kind of modest when it comes to that, you know, and it's not, it's not my favorite genre. I can, I can appreciate it when it's done really well, you know, and I like a Marvel movie as much as anyone, but you know, and I, and I tend to like the DC movies more than the Marvel movies, to be honest, because they tend to take more of a different kind of approach to it, you know, but it's really kind of dependent on the execution to me. And, and I just found the Captain Marvel as much as I liked some aspects of it, not Captain Marvel, sorry, Shazam. Well, he is Captain Marvel. Well, he but is Captain there, Marvel. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were, there, there were, there were just, you know, it was just at times I felt like I'd seen that movie before. You know, okay. it didn't, it didn't feel that different from to me from, you know, one of the million Spider-Man movies that they've made. You know, the one Spider-Man movie that I really liked was well, Into the Dark, not Into the Dark, Into the Spider Verse. Sorry, I thought that sure. was one of the best well, superhero movies okay. I had ever seen. Well, that, that, you know, as you bring that up, that movie up, one of the reasons that you probably like those two movies, they're probably the same reason why I like both Shazam and Into the Spider-Verse, which is they both present uh, a hero whose family base is very central to the character, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so in Shazam, you had this character, this kid, you know, Billy Batson, who was, who was, who was an orphan, you know, and he, he, gets it, he gets in with this adopted family, a foster family, and they are very central to him as he's trying to find himself uh, a, a family unit, you know, sort of a power base, a structure, you know, yeah. that everybody, every, every hero needs. One of the reasons why I like Into the Spider Verse was that we we got to see a, a version of Spider Man who had that, you know, yeah. whereas Peter Parker never really did, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I thought that made it that's one of the things that made that that version of the character unique, and I think that's one of the things that makes Shazam unique is that he does have these these people that he's trying to connect with, you know, and 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 they and eventually they become very central to him. No, and I, that was the part of, that was the part that, of the movie that I liked. Yeah, yeah and that was the yeah, part yeah, and, yeah, and that's one of the things I think I think that's that's very different for superheroes because you don't get. You get okay. You get absolutely zero of that from any of the Marvel movies. None yeah. of the Marvel movies have anything to do with anybody's family whatsoever, no. right? None of them, unless they're. Well, they, they unless, still have unless, part unless of them. I mean, is, unless your dad is Kurt Russell and he's ego, the living planet. <laughs> there's no real family issues in Marvel to deal with, right? So that so that you're not getting any of that. So it's not similar to any of those. It's not similar to any of the other DC movies either. So I mean, I, I don't. I don't get the I don't get the idea that the the, the the idea that this is movie feels familiar in that sense. What I say uh, familiar, I, what I say familiar though, it's familiar in the way that all superhero movies though are familiar. You know, you get these, you get you get the guy shooting, you know, not lasers out of his hands like you complained about in Captain Marvel, right. but lightning bolts. You know, you get that action scene. You get the flying around in the sky action scene. You get the, you know, but it's there's the, a lot of there, you do. I, look, I, I'll give you that for sure. That there's, you know, there's obviously there's always going to be familiar elements, just like a Tarantino movie is always going to have familiar elements. But in this sense, I think that. What I found with Shazam is that it was exceptionally clever. There's a lot of stuff in this that I just had not seen before. Uh, and a great example, I think, is the the scene. This is kind of spoilerish for those that haven't seen it yet. So, fast well, I mean, it, it hasn't too. come out at this point, though. We probably shouldn't get into it too much. Well, I'm all. getting into it anyways. It was in one of the trailers anyways. But there's a scene where, uh, towards the end, where Mark Strong, uh, Savannah, and Shazam are fighting, and they're in the sky. And Savannah's giving this, like, you know, the bad guy speech about all oh, how he's going to like tear oh, yeah, yeah. and all this other oh, stuff. Yeah, and they're that's... way far away from each other. And normally like in the movies, you know, you'd see this happen. You wouldn't think twice, but here you have Shazam. Who's like, they're maybe like, I don't know, half a mile away from each other in this air floating. You know, he's <laughs> giving the bad guy speech. Shazam's like, what? He's like, are you giving a bad guy? I can't hear you, which makes perfect sense. Like if someone is that far away, you can be like, what? Even with superpowers, yeah. you're like, huh? And I just thought that was like exceptionally clever. And it kind of, it ruined that moment for anybody else in the future to ever do that. Sure. And I just thought it was great that they <laughs> seized upon that. And there's so many other clever moments that I was just like, that is actually kind of brilliant. That's really hilarious. Look, right, or just or just funny. Like, honestly, if you don't laugh at Shazam, like, seriously, you are fucking dead inside. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I laughed, you know, and, and look, I mean... You know, I didn't, 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 I didn't dislike it. You know, we all I'm sorry. Talk, nobody's head got blown off. Chris, we know how much, how much, you know, <laughs> as, as much as I hate to even bring this up, you know, rotten tomatoes, you know, the whole thing, is it fresh? Is it rotten? You know, my review will be fresh. It'll be positive, but it's just, I'm not as, 
a, a few yeah, so seconds. Look, that look, is, I hear that, you. I'm not. I'm not going to go over the top with my with my. I dad. didn't. I didn't really like the first yeah, Deadpool I, I, either, though. Then again, you know, I mean, that was the thing. I remember I was very hate fun. Deadpool. I love that. I love the first Deadpool, but but I'm not going to go over the top with my with my with my uh like for for Sam. I guess I'll write my review of that tonight since I think the embargo's passed now. But um, it's but okay. uh, you know, I. I, I, my, if I have gripes with it, is that I thought too many of the the funniest scenes were in the trailer, which yeah. kind of bugged me. But the, uh, but there was uh, there were other scenes that made up for it. like there were other funny scenes in it, which which uh, which I was I, which I appreciated. I love Jack Dylan Grazer as his as his friend as oh uh, he's great. Yeah, he's he's he, was pretty, he was yeah he was really good. He's he's, he's a lot of fun. I, I seem to like him in everything that he does too at this yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I really, really like him, um, and I, I, like I said, I appreciate the whole family aspect of the movie as well. The stuff with Mark Strong—he's a generic villain for yeah. the most part, you know. And you yeah, get generic very, very villain hero standoffs. Generic, and, and that, but a little dark. But yeah, yeah a generic. little bit darker. But and that's something that the Warner Brothers movies still have yet to really overcome. They've yet yeah, to have well, that. That was the big movie. problem with Aquaman as well. You know, I mean, I thought well, Aquaman's that... a problem with Wonder Woman. It's a problem with pretty much every movie. It's a problem with Justice League. Yeah. It's a problem with every movie they've had is that they've had really generic villains. They've well, except yet to have a great one. Yeah, you know, they had Black Manta, but he's kind of more of an anti-hero almost. <laughs> Black Manta. Nah, he's a he's a villain. Yeah, he's he's, yeah, he's definitely up. a villain, and 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 he has potential to be a much better villain when he gets more time. Um, but they kind of Black said, Manta's awesome. I want him back. I think he'll be back for I, Aquaman. Too. I want him back too. Like I said, I think he has potential to be a, a great villain if when he's like the key villain, he's sort of the secondary villain in Aquaman. I want him to be the main villain because he has that potential. I think he'll villain. be the main villain in in the. And I'm this is just speculation, but I think he'll be the main villain in two, and then they'll bring in a secondary villain to kind of you know because you want to have a new face in there too. But I yep. think he'll be the prime. Kind of like yep. the way Orm was in the first song. And uh, just to, for me personally, I still, I like Aquaman better than Shazam overall. Mm -hmm. I gave them the same rating, but I don't give a fuck about ratings. I fucking yeah. hate giving scores and numbers. I hate them. I was originally going to give Shazam an eight. Mm -hmm. And then hey, I did a four. Three. What, why, why are they both? This, it's like, come on, man. It's all yeah, relative. I mean, you know, it, it really is. <laughs> I don't. It's like people can fight over it, and I don't. I really don't. Yeah, care. they if get I had a very choice, hung even... up on it in our in our in our comments. I mean, I get shit they every really time. I do. Give, every time so I give a movie a edit. seven, I get so much crap from it, and it's like he only ever gives sevens, and it's it's not. I mean, and funny. between honestly, like <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, that's a broad scope. Yeah. You know, like yep. I mean, even like when I think about it, I hate even thinking about what score I'm going to give. You know, and then I'm just like, I don't fucking know. Like, who fucking cares? Like, did you read my review? So did nothing that I wrote matter? Why did I write anything if the score is what people are going to be gravitating towards? Why don't I just, uh, you know, Shazam review nine. That's it. <laughs> right, you don't yeah. need any words. Here's a number. That's it. You know, there's there's a reason for it. But at the same time, I, I can't say that a nine is fucking justified. Fight over it. I don't give a fuck. Like, I yeah. the number aspect. I hate it. I fucking hate it. I hate. That's why I hate Rotten Tomatoes. It's not that I hate people that work there. I, I don't. In fact, I know people that work there that are really great people. I just hate the whole, like, how people are hung up on percentages. Yeah, and that metric of it, yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I actually put on Twitter because uh, Dead Poet Society has the answer for everything that you need in this life. The whole scene in Dead Poet Society where he's explaining, they open up that book of poetry and they're talking about the – the Pritchard scale of how you measure whether or not a poem is good. And it's this like very fucking stale mathematical type impression of rating poetry. And then he turns to the class and he says, now I want you to rip that page out of your book. In fact, rip out the whole chapter because you can't grade poetry in that way. Like poetry like art, it speaks to you. You know, it means different things to different people. It, 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 there's so much more to it. And to put a number, to assign a number to anything, that's just bogus. This, this, it's not math. This is not, you're not building a building. This isn't science. This is art. It's expression. So putting a number to it is, it's so fruitless. And the, the fact that people lose their minds over it, fighting over it, like they, they'll die on that hill. And it's the most worthless death you could have. Well, and it's funny right now, I'm looking, I'm looking at, well, I give your, I give your whole speech right there a five out of 10. <laughs> oh, oh. Just I take Just that. I take that. I'm looking I at rotten. That. I'm looking yeah. at rotten tomatoes right now, though. They're at, at Twitter right now, and you know, 
David Sandberg is writing, uh, you know, he's retweeting Rotten Tomatoes where they say, check back tomorrow after three for the first tomato re- reader meter score yeah. for Shazam. Where do you think it'll land? And he's freaking out, you know, and it's it, and it's positive. It's fresh. It's 94 percent fresh. But it's just like, why is that the do or die for a movie, though? And, and it's that's weird because the sad you can part see is that studios have fucking taken that bait because they know that people go to Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. So now uh, it's well, become important to studios to have that. And it has because it's become and it's a why I, dude. It's why I always get emails from publicists like, can you please yeah. put oh, your God. to write? Oh, yes. I get them all the time. Minutes, within five minutes of it going live. Right, exactly. And I'm like, festival. can you guys just wait until I do it? Because yeah. I, I take my time. I don't really care. I take my yeah, time. You're busy, you know, too. You're at a film right festival. Away, you're working your ass off. We're in a screening yeah. or something like that. And I have five emails from the reps. It's like, can you add it? You know, yeah. it's like, fuck, I was in a screening. What do you think? <laughs> I know. It's like, relax. Like, they fuck want it. that. They want yeah. that one percentage point that my review might get. Might and, get then, or, and then like, Rotten Tomatoes will email you and they'll be like, <laughs> we, this publicist is bothering us, wanting us, can you please add your thing? We don't have time to do it. And it's like, guys, I posted it five minutes ago. It's insane. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's a sad thing, honestly. I, I, I really, I, you know, the fact that people will go to Rotten Tomatoes and look at a percentage and decide if that's a movie they're going to see or not. It's just insane to me. It truly is insane. I, I think it is like I'm not even bullshitting. I'm not tap dancing around it. It's insane to think that, oh, well, that's 63 percent. Dude, there's movies that are like 12 percent rotten that I fucking love. Love like this. Just it's a terrible fucking scale. If you want to use it as a basis, fine, I guess a basis for popular opinion, maybe. But this is, you know, a, a population of what seven billion people. You Always know, you have our readers. No matter what score I give the movie, if the movie looks interesting to you, go see it. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely. Just, like, best I can tell you is like this is just my opinion. If you, if it looks like something you could be interested in, then you should go see it. And if you want to talk to me about it, then shoot me a message. Yeah, like, go see the go see the movie. Don't let me just totally turn you on or off a of flip off a of film. Don't let me do for that. for real. Like you should see what like I. I've been very clear that I hated Captain Marvel and I saw it fucking twice. Uh, I don't like it. I think it's a a bad superhero movie, but obviously I'm not in the majority opinion on that, or at least my opinion really doesn't, uh, you know, affect anything that has to do with this box office and that's fine. But again, I think it's a movie that's, that's very successful making a lot of money that I think is a bad movie. And there's your percentage there for that one. So there's an, a, an example. It, it won't be, on it's not the first. It's not the yeah, first. It's, exactly. It's not the first. There's, <laughs> there's the first. plenty of movies that like make a lot of money that this, how did this make so much money? It's a bad movie, but it did anyways. And you're just like, well, whatever, you know, but and it, so it goes. And then there's movies that are, you know, like Shawshank Redemption was a huge flop. And that's a great fucking movie. Yeah. But yeah. hey, there you go. Um, yeah. Anyways. Well, Travis, I guess I guess that's it. Hey, eh? you got to. Yes. I've Chris got is going to cry. Run. Chris, you're not going to cry, are you? No, but it was nice talking to you. Please no, it was, it, was a lot, it was a lot of fun joining you guys. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Yeah, well, uh, we'll have hey, we've, back on. Yeah, we've tried to have you on a couple times. You're so elusive. Yeah, it's usually something on my end that, that, that I can't that I can't do it. But I'm so, glad we I'm glad we could get it to work out today. It was a lot of fun. So, Travis, yeah, where, where can people check out your stuff? Uh, you can check me out every day at punchdrunkcritics.com. I'm there all the time. And I'm on a... A bunch of different outlets here in D.C. If anybody's in the D.C. area, um, if you just look at my name, you can find me. There's no point in me listing all of them. <laughs> but mainly punchdrunkcritics.com. And your DC show. represent. And we're on the same we're on the same network, Blog Talk Radio. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. What's, Travis what's, actually what's, helped us uh, get here to uh, what's Blog the Talk. Name, what's the name of your show, Travis? Uh, my show is called Cinema Royale. Uh, I've been doing it for, jeez, uh, I, I just, I was just about the other day i've been doing that show for six years it was wow. the, the first review i ever did on the show was uh david chase's not fade away oh, <laughs> and, and you, i like that movie i i kind of liked it too but uh yeah i remembered it because there's another movie coming out called not fade away and i was like it's not oh, yeah that i was just gonna yeah. say i was getting a little confused um yeah. and sometimes you have me on as a guest Sometimes, and you that's are. when it's called what Cinema Royale with cheese. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. It's Cinema Royale with Canadian bacon. <laughs> 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 yeah, but this is great, guys. I hope you guys ask me back to do it again. Oh, again, absolutely, honestly. dude. Yeah, Come yeah, on. come back anytime. <laughs> yeah, 
awesome. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow I see Dolpha, so I will be a little bit busy. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very upset if it's suddenly the the beard and the black instead of the beard and the bald. But, you know, <laughs> if it has to be anybody, I, don't know. I gotta to say be. I really like Travis. <laughs> yeah. If, if it had ever- to. If there's ever a week where I fill in for you, then I and I suggest we change the name to Beard and the Black just for Dude, that one we week. We would totally do that. That would be funny. And you know what? And if it was both you guys, then it should be the Black and the Bald. <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like a it sounds like a soap opera. It sounds like it said it said it said just it'll just be a poster of it'll just be a picture of Michael Jordan. <laughs> it sounds like a legit soap opera that'd be like on TV one or something. Yeah. Black and the Bald. <laughs> it'll be a, it'll be a poster of um, Mario Van Peebles in Solo. Oh God! Okay. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> Holy shit! You're digging into the trenches. Jesus. Man. <laughs> oh. All right, That's you guys. Cool you never saw? <laughs> no, okay. No. I have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I watched right, all those Ed Van Peebles movies that he was making for a while there. <laughs> all right, except for except for except for Badass, which was awesome. Um, I like the movie too. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys. Thanks. This has been okay, awesome. Dude. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. See you, Travis. All right, later. All right. So that was uh, Travis Hobson joining us. Uh, always nice to have a uh, a guest on the show. Um, so yeah, he was fun to talk to. Uh, so now we've covered uh, Shazam, Us, and Dragged, and I know we're still going to do some uh, S. Craig Zoller stuff, but it's we do have some more news. Yeah. To to get through real quick. Uh, and then one thing I did want to add one thing to that once upon a time thing. So well, after I watched that trailer, which I, I really enjoyed, uh, and I saw Mike Mo uh, as Bruce Lee, I was truly floored. And oh, yeah. I, I tweeted out, you know, just sounds like, so Mike Mo for Shane Chi, yeah? Because I mean, fuck, like that was just like a perfect impression. And Shane Chi is basically Bruce Lee. Uh, hang on one second. Okay, Blackbeard of the Bulb. That's actually not bad. <laughs> My son. My son just came in, just came in with a note, and he said it should be Blackbeard and the Bald, which is oh, not bad. Blackbeard. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's listening in the background. Uh, so, anyways, uh, I think I, I, I was really genuinely impressed by Mike Mun. I think you know everybody's trying to think, well, who should play Shang Chi? Uh, I don't know, man. Like that's it, there's no way that Feige and everybody else can at least be considering Mike Mo at this point. It's one of those things that you see and you're just like, wow, that is amazing. And I'm not saying that, you know, Mike Mo should go, you know, place Shang-Chi as Bruce Lee in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think, if anything, it just shows that he has that range that he could, like, you know, take on a, a, a create a persona because that's pretty impressive, you know, and that's, you know, uh, uh, to my knowledge, that's not how Mike Mo really is. Um, but it shows that range. It shows that dynamic. It shows that he's got the martial arts. He's a lifelong martial artist as well. Uh, you know, he's got all the qualifications in that sense. And I guess... People may want to fight over yeah. whether he's Chinese or Korean or whatever. And it's like, well, come on. You know, I, I feel like you're kind of really getting into the weeds on stuff, especially for a character that the truth is most people don't know anything about. And it's like they're like, oh, they suddenly care. Mm-hmm. His comics aren't flying off the racks. He doesn't even he's not even in any comics right now. Um, so anyways, uh, I just want to say champion once again, Mike Mo for Shang-Chi. Uh, I, he's got to at least be being considered. Yeah. I mean, he point. does. It does seem like a no brainer almost, you know, I mean. Yeah. You know, I feel like somebody like maybe John Cho would have been considered years ago, but he's too old now. You know, he's middle aged and they need a young guy. Unfortunately, you know, you do. And I think that, you know, I think he does seem like a like a no brainer almost. You know, I mean, he, he he was very impressed in that trailer. I mean, I'd like to see the actual movie. Yeah, who knows, watch, who watch. knows how much he's actually going to be in it, though? I mean, it might just be a very small role. You may have seen all yeah. the Bruce stuff already. But uh you know, I, yeah, very impressive. And especially, you know, I'm a lifelong Bruce Lee fan, and I've never seen anybody capture Bruce Lee like that. The only other time that we even came close, and I don't even know how he sounded, was the guy who played the goalie in Shaolin Soccer looked like him. I don't know if he necessarily yeah. sounded like him, but he got, like, the mannerisms and the attitude right and very yeah. curious to see. And, you know, that does seem like a no-brainer. You know, and I good, love, I love dragging up. the Bruce Lee story with Jason Scott Lee. Yeah. And look- although... He he had a he he played Bruce Lee well, but he didn't play him exactly. He he had the voice down, but he didn't have the look exactly. But he still had like a a very distinct look that that lent itself to the to the film. Um, and again, I think that's why you know Mike Mo doesn't have to look you know perfectly like Bruce Lee or or any of that to, in order to play Shang Chi. I think that there's a lot of there's a lot open that they can explore with that. So yeah. anyway. 
guys. I was super I just impressed. Saw with that. Larry Cohen died. Uh, yeah, I saw that this morning. That's too bad. Did you guys? Did you ever watch uh, King Cohen, the documentary about him? Pretty interesting. If you ever want to see like a good look at what like it was like making exploitation movies in the seventies and the eighties, it's on Shutter and it's a uh, it's a good little documentary. Lots of stories in there, guerrilla style filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Pretty interesting, interesting stuff. Maybe I'll take a look someday. I did watch the documentary on HBO about um, oh fuck, I can't remember her name now. The chick that created the blood test thing. I can't remember. Oh, Theranos. Yeah, yeah. Theranos. The- yeah. Yeah, well, you know, my my girlfriend works in a lab, right? And she watched it on Monday night when it aired as well. I'd seen it at Sundance, and that is Elizabeth Holmes. That's a yeah, it's a crazy story. It is pretty fascinating. I definitely recommend it uh, if you're looking for a good watch. It's yeah, it's fascinating to watch how a person that simply it's almost they they've cracked the formula on how to trick people. Yeah, it's like. And they've tr- the 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 level at which she has fooled people all the way up to like politicians and highly influential people, and that they just bought it on face value, never truly understanding what she has had done or rather not done, mm-hmm. and they just bought it hook, line, and sinker. Well, they wanted it's to actually you. scary, but it's yeah. actually kind of scary when you see that because you know you have like Joe Biden sitting down next to her endorsing this thing and talking her up publicly, and you're just like, wow, you know, when people are like, people wouldn't, they're like, Govern- they would never lie, they wouldn't go out and lie. Well, and it's like, just, yes, they would. Well, it's not even that he's lying; he just doesn't know anything. But that's it. But that's it's the same. It's the same thing. The guy, the the ex, the former, what was the 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 politician, the high Henry, Henry level. Kissinger? No, no, from Reagan's uh, administration, the one whose grandson was the whistleblower. I forget his name. Oh, oh fuck. I can't remember. I can't, yeah. I'm so terrible with but the name. Super but yeah. respected guy in the Republican Party, way up there. And he, all these people fell for it because they wanted to fall for it because what she yeah. was peddling sounds like a great idea, but it just doesn't make any and sense. And none of them, and none of them saw it in action, like her little yeah. machine. They never even saw it in no. action to the point that it actually worked. No. And I think that she just duped them, but she did work overtime to trick them into, you know, to believing in this thing. But it was so, you know, she made a good video too. It was kind of like the fire festival in that sense where oh, yeah, they made I, that I, video, they shot that video and it just looked like, you know, beautiful models and bikinis and beaches. And it's like, holy shit. Yes. I want to go to this. And then you get there and you're like, oh, my God, it's a fucking train wreck. She, I, I will say this, though. She deserves to go to jail for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. She's a dude. She's a fucking sociopath. Absolutely. And it's and it's creepy, you know, just looking at her and looking at the videos that, you know, even Errol Morris, one of the greatest you know, documentary filmmakers of all time, not a stupid person, you know, and you see in the in the in the in the outtakes you know, how much he was falling for her spiel and how yeah. betrayed he must have felt afterwards because he gave Alex Gibney all of his tapes, gave yeah. it to him. It's like, yeah. do what you do, what you will with them. And, you know, and that, and that was pretty damning because he had extensive interviews with her where she's just lying to the camera. But it's people were duped. People thought that she was legit because they were told that she was legit. You know, giving tech yeah. talks and, and stuff like that. And well, and she was very convincing herself. Like the one kid, the the Reagan kid, <laughs> getting of his name. But yeah. when you know, he was like, I think I'm going to quit. This is all crazy. Like I can see it's just, it's a fucking train wreck. And then he would go and talk to her and she would just talk him right back out yeah. on the floor. And you know, because the she thing was so convincing. And you know, the crazy thing about her, though, is that she... You know, it's like that old Seinfeld line, right? Where, he, where George says, it's not a lie if you believe it's true. You know, and it's and it's weird because part of her, I think, really did believe that she could do it. She had this crazy yeah. belief in herself that it was all going to work out. And, you know, and it was this unearned belief in herself. I felt know, like but, she, I felt like she was crazy. gambling. She was gambling yeah. on this thing. It's like she had an idea, but she didn't make it yet. It's like somebody that like it's like a kid that has an idea for a, a science fair project. And they're like, oh, this is gonna be really cool. And they draw it all out. And they're like, this is going to be amazing. But they didn't make it. You know, they didn't do it. They had the idea written on paper. But they didn't bring it to fruition in order to make it actually happen. And I feel like that's what she did. She was like, well, I'll just say that it is and I'll just and then by the time, you know, I'm finally ready to go public or whatever, it'll be ready. It'll be done, you know, and, uh, you know, her, you know, how her story kept changing about 
her inspiration for it about her uncle. Like he had, oh, God. it was like all different. Oh, he had cancer. Oh, he had this. Oh, he had that. He, and it was just like, you're fucking full of shit lady. So, but anyways, it's, uh, you know, I'm glad that there was justice done in that, but look at how far she got, man. This shit was in Walgreens. Like it was everywhere. Like, People my really girlfriend, my it. girlfriend just texted me and she said the thing that freaked her out most about Elizabeth Holmes is uh, is the fake voice she used. You know, oh, yeah. speaking like this. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Elizabeth Holmes, and I just wanted to say, no blinking. Uh, also, no yeah. blinking. That's a freak. No me blinking, out. and then the black turtlenecks because she wanted to be like the medical Steve Jobs. I, I mean, it helped too. You know, I mean that even that woman from from the from the from the institute says that you know it helped. She was attractive. She was, you know, and it was kind of that was like that, weird, that, like in a weird in a weird way. way. Yeah, but she was attractive though, and it was kind of one but of those things. Where, I think she was attractive to like a lot of these old fucks that endorsed her too, because they're yeah. like, oh, no she's doubt, like, no. you know, because. Really, like by my standards, she's not attractive. But I think by like these old guys that are like, hey, who knows? Maybe she, I mean, hey, this is speculation, but hey, maybe there was like some, you know, stuff going on there behind well, the scenes. Who, who knows? I mean, you know, I don't even think there needed to be because they could all smell money. That was the thing, right? Yeah, and everybody wanted true. to be, you know, there could have been the upside of it could have been trillions of dollars, right? And changed medicine forever. But it was just an idea. She had no idea how to make it work. And we're years and years and years and years and years away from that, unfortunately. Well, I mean, Jesus Christ, like the machine is just such a, you know, and it was just, it's funny how it was fooling Walgreens too. You know I mean? It's like, fuck. Yeah, I know. That's insane. The fact that these things were there, if, but then they weren't really there too. That was the other, they weren't, they weren't, they're like, Hey, we're doing this blood test. And then you would show up and they'd be like, well, actually we're going to, we're actually going to draw blood from your veins. Like we normally do because of this certain thing. You're just like. What the fuck am I paying for then? Like, what is this? Like, and, why and not, even? And not giving them accurate results. That's the scariest thing. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. We could go on this forever. I mean, the whole thing was just massive fucking fraud. And the scary part is that how easily people could just be duped into buying it. Or beyond that, how much we how much faith we we place in a new product without really knowing that much about it. You know, it's kind of scary. It makes you think makes you think about you know every time something new pops up like is it really that great do how much do you really know so, so should anyways, we highly recommend watching that run down a couple of these stories really fast <laughs> so danny treo to voice boots the monkey and dora the explorer you know i just saw the trailer for that it dropped this morning with uh isabel i, I didn't watch it yet but I mean, it looks great. very much it looks very much like a jumanji welcome to the jungle kind yeah. of kind of take you know a fun adventure movie for kids and i'm sure that they'll like it danny trailers boots the monkey so he, the only the only reason i even put that in our agenda for today is yeah. that that story is the biggest story we've had in like four months really like eleven thousand shares i mean people do love dora the explorer like i can see that that's but that's book, crazy you know? danny trejo yeah. doing voicing a monkey is the biggest story we've had People are weird, you know. I don't know I mean, if it got picked up by like somebody, like maybe maybe Danny Trejo picked it up. I don't know, but I I'm amazed at the yeah. fucking speed at which this story has taken off. Because I mean, I have nothing invested in it. I never watched Dora. I've never seen Dora the Explorer. My I'm kid not. didn't watch it. Um, nothing against it, but we just I missed that boat. Like it wasn't part of my life, and it's amazing. I don't know if it speaks to a generational thing, like the younger kids, you know, that are growing up now watched it and they're just like, Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and that's cool. But fuck, that's just, well, it's like, it's like Pokemon, you know, and it, and it's like detective Pikachu, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, then that's going to be, you know, they showed the preview of that before Shazam yesterday and the audience went mental, you know, and it yeah, was, yeah. And, it's, and it is one of those things that like, I missed Pokemon when it happened and I never really understood that world or what the appeal was. But, you know, my girlfriend's a couple of years younger and she's super excited to see Detective Pikachu and that movie is going to I'm, I'm like excited to dollars. see it. And I'm yeah, not a fun. huge it does, Pokemon it does, guy, but like fun movie. Yeah, I did play. I did play Pokemon Go for a good spell, and I did get uh, corrupted. I, I, and I tried it a couple times. Yeah, I drove like, around neighborhoods trying to capture Pokemon. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit it. I don't play it anymore. It just like it got to a point. It's like this is ridiculous. Actually, once I caught Pikachu, I decided I was good. <laughs> I was like I got note. the one I wanted, and done. Speaking but, of uh, interesting remakes, though, so Ma- Mason Blair, uh, Macon, Macon is Macon. That's it's weird. Me. 
uh, he did a movie that I really liked a couple of years ago called uh, I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. Uh, I saw it at Sundance. It won the Grand Jury Prize. It was a really good movie. It's on Netflix. It was a Netflix what? original. Okay, so real, before we go into what he's doing, sell me on that movie. Because I see it on Netflix, and it's one I've almost tried a couple of times. Yeah, it's, it's, I, it's... I want to invest in it. What is it okay. about? So basically, Melanie Linsky, she plays this kind of depressed woman who stumbles onto a violent situation, right? And the way that she reacts to it with her neighbor, played by Elijah Wood, who's kind of like this kind of survivalist, but pathetic kind of, who's almost like a Danny McBride type character, is mm. interesting. And it comes to, it ends, like it has an extremely violent ending, right? And, and, it, and there's a lot of violent episodes in it, but there's action in it. And it's this kind of crazy genre mashup, but also a drama, but also really funny. It's a really hard movie to describe, and it's a really hard movie to categorize. But I would say give it a chance because I think it would be okay. a movie that you'd really like. I mean, I okay, really that's, like it too. That's good enough for me. That's and good enough for me. And he's also the writer on all of um, Jeremy Saulnier's movies. Yeah, Blue Ruin and including Green Including Hold the Dark, unfortunately, which I thought was a pretty bad movie. Uh, but uh, Still haven't watched it. Really, a lot of it has to do yeah. with your what you've told yeah. me about it. Yeah. I should just watch. And, and that... To be clear, I will watch whatever the fuck I want, regardless of what Mr. Bummer yeah. says. But oh. I do trust I do trust Chris on on certain levels, except for fun movies. And I, I I've, I've avoided it as a result. Um, yeah. And I did have somebody else when I was actually at the uh, Bohemian Rhapsody junket try and talk me into it, tell me how great it was. But I I don't know. I'm still. Eh, I mean, I, you know, anytime somebody's torn about that, I'd always say watch it for yourself and make up your own mind yeah, but you know? i just don't have, i just don't have like the yeah. des- like the desires not there and i really like jeremy saulnier but it is a, it, i mean i like him less now after having seen that movie unfortunately but it has and its- see i don't want to i don't want to kill that yeah. and even and you know I, I i still have to finish true detective season three mm-hmm. which i think i'm just going to start from scratch again because i just it's too well far. he 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 got he he quit that though he only yeah, did two episodes of it uh there's a whole story there apparently yeah, yeah. uh but uh, you know i mean it had its moments, but it also just struck me as a director who's not super mature and who's not really, you know, at the level that he should be given the kind of carte blanche that he was given by Netflix, you know, and, and a little bit. <laughs> and, but that kind of speaks a lot of Netflix. Yeah, too. it does. You know, and, and it's I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, Toxic Adventure, though, interesting. Another franchise I have absolutely nothing invested in at all. You know, you wonder what the IP is on these, like why it's so valuable and why all these things need to be rebooted but you know if you're gonna hire somebody mason blair make macon blair is an interesting guy to do it i guess yeah i mean i'm i'm down with it i mean i watched toxic avenger i think i told my toxic avenger story on the podcast before yeah. way yeah. too young renting it from the video store because the video store owner was like yeah you guys should get toxic avenger because he was like kind of like the us of that generation before there was internet or anything. And he's like a movie nut. So of course he's gonna be like, yeah, you should watch toxic Avenger, man. <laughs> and you know, here we are as kids watching that shit. There's no reason kids should have been watching that. I, what I find interesting is they're doing it for legendary. Mm-hmm. And the thing about that was appealing about toxic Avenger was the fact that it was a trauma movie. There's lots of nudity. There's lots of like extreme violence. It won't be any so, of that in a legendary movie. It'll be and that's insane. and that's why I'm saying like, what is the movie then? Mm-hmm. You know, what is what exactly is it going to be? And I feel like Macon Blair is a guy that would know that. So I'm very curious. Maybe Legendary is going to do an R-rated kind of thing, and I feel like it doesn't work without it. If it's PG-13, ah oh, man, that's going to be a tough fucking sell. And you know what's a tough sell? I gotta pee right now. I'm sorry. I gotta go okay. real bad. Go get you. <laughs> I'll <Yep>. be back. <laughs> go do. Chris is going pee. Chris is going pee right now. Chris is taking a pee. He's taking a boop, 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 pee pee. Chris is taking a pee. He's taking a pee. Chris is Chris is Chris is Chris is taking a pee pee. Oh oh oh! Chris is taking a pee. Chris is taking a pee. What? Chris is taking a pee. Pee, 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 This is the longest pee ever. I don't know if I can keep this song going. Chris is taking a pee. 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 Chris is taking a pee.
Chris is taking a pee. Chris is taking a pee. Chris is taking a pee. Chris is and taking. I'm back. Chris, uh, Chris is back. That's what I was singing while I was going. All righty. <clears throat> All, All right, right, so, so uh, next, do you want to talk about, uh, well, Game of Thrones is premiering soon, but an interesting story dropped this week about Amelia Clark. Like a, a story that has given me a whole new level of respect yeah. uh, for her. And I know that a lot of people, you know, they have you know medical issues that, that they don't really talk about or, or that you know about, and, you know, people are kind of silently struggling. Uh, and Amelia came out and, and just kind of gave a very honest, uh, open a tale about what happened to her in the New Yorker. She wrote like kind of you know, the this, this story about how she basically had two brain brain aneurysms over the course of making Game of Thrones. Her first one started in February 2011. Uh, after the first season, she had a brain aneurysm and they had to do surgery and all this other stuff. And, you know, to the point where she like, you know, she she had uh, memory problems and all this other stuff. And she was very concerned about if she'd even be able to go on. And I found it just so amazing that she was able to make the show. And even she even says like in season two, she's like, this is her quote. If I'm being truly being, if I'm truly being honest, every minute of every day, I thought I was going to die. Like wow. that is some serious shit to live with. And when you look back on the work that she did in game of Thrones, like that's pretty fucking amazing. Oh, it sure is to because pull you off what she pulled never, off. No, you'd never know. No, you'd never know. I had. I. I mean, I had. Obviously, how would I have any idea? There's yeah. nothing where I was like, you know, it looks like she's struggling with a brain aneurysm. <laughs> you know, that's doesn't even come into my brain. But you know, she. This is like a very serious thing, especially for an actress. That you know, you need to memorize your lines. You got to be able to perform and focus and all this other stuff. Also, at the, at the peak, I saw it like the peak of her career too, like a very important time because of those first couple seasons of Game of Thrones, just when it was picking up steam was when she started getting these major roles and things started yeah. coming her way, you know, and God, imagine if she had been sidelined, you know, and, and it's the fact that she was able to pull through and the fact that she was able to turn it around speaks volumes to, you know, what a talented actor she is and what a strong human being she is, because I, I think a lot of people that would have been in her situation would have just kind of given up, you know, and, and, yeah. it's, and it's pretty amazing that she you know, really fucking fought for her success and deserves her success. 100%. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, just a, a really amazing story. And yeah. yeah, it just gives me a whole nother respect for the Khaleesi because fuck, you know, that is some serious shit. So, you know, kudos ah, to her. And maybe, then, you know, she was maybe, talking maybe about... She, maybe she does deserve to sit on the Iron Throne. <laughs> I might have to take my John John Snow Funko off my mantle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, look, John, you're cool. You're like the cool, typical hero. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to give it to Khaleesi. She had a brain aneurysm. or something. So. You can have him standing next to the throne. All right. <laughs> uh, I think one of them is going to die, though, for sure. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Um, but anyways, I, you know, I, she, she had also mentioned, you know, she, that while she was doing press, you know, she was times where and she went to Comic-Con and she like felt like, you know, she was going to throw up and she like all this stuff was like, affecting uh, but you know, she, she did, she did her job though. And she, gave and good she, interviews. yeah, she still she went out, she did it. And she's like, you know, did her interviews and everything. And it's like, if I, I, I almost feel like if I ever have to, if I ever get the chance to, to interview her, I almost want to be like, are you okay right now? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to slap like, a smile on her face and, you know, and did her job, you know? And I think that's a pretty, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for her. A lot yeah. of respect. You know, and similarly, uh, Aubrey Plaza had a similar thing. She had a stroke and had to learn how to talk and walk again, mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy. And then, uh, <clears throat> uh, Selma Blair has, um, uh, uh, MS. Uh, MS, yeah, mm -hmm. and her voice is deeply affected now. Yeah, which is pretty fucked up. So, you know, there's people out there. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I think a lot of times we tend to look at people in Hollywood as almost like perfect to yeah. a point. You know, like kind of like they don't have the same issues that we have in real life, but they they do. They do. Um, or sometimes <laughs> though, then there are those in Hollywood that do think of themselves as a little bit better and not prone to the same <laughs> rules and laws as we are. And one of them, I guess, is Barbara Streisand. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm glad you brought that up because that bitch yeah. is fucking crazy. Look, yeah. listen, Barbara Streisand, I don't give a fuck. You love her songs or fucking you watch beaches every year with your girlfriends. Well, oh, that's Bette Midler, buddy. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Sorry. Don't Bette bring Midler. Bette into this. Fuck. <laughs> the divine Miss M. <laughs> uh, 
Well, she's kind of she's kind of weirdly outspoken too, but but she's she's less less than Streisand. Sorry, you didn't thought... say pretty much it was okay that Michael Jackson molested those kids because he's famous. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, and that's what's so fucked up about what Streisand yeah. said is that, you know, <laughs> she sounds kind of like like almost like your your racist sexist grandmother. Yeah, it's from another era. That's like. They were fine. Well, I, they this, said they wanted to be there. In this I, case, they didn't though, kill it, them. it's that crazy Hollywood mentality where they're just a little bit better than Huba, that not quite prone to the same, not not as they don't have to answer to the same rules that we do, you know. And, 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 and it's and, a completely elitist kind of attitude yeah. where it's ultimately saying that. Hey, they wanted to be around us famous folk, and that's what you get. They didn't die. They didn't get hurt. They got some money in a free house. Also, they got their assholes licked. Also, and... you know, Barbara Streisand now is clarifying her comments. But yeah, bullshit. Her. It's the yeah. most phony. It's like, I guarantee you, that's her rep saying, hey, you need yeah. to put something out now. And that's the thing. Like, people think that every time somebody puts out a clarifying statement, it's really just a fucking, it's like, it's the equivalent of getting a fire extinguisher and shooting it at the fire. Yeah. That's all it is. And then, or you let's know. blame the person that interviewed me, you know, and yeah. they got it wrong. I, one of the little, it. one of the little people got it wrong, but you know, it's of course. fuck her though. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so fucked up to say, I mean, the bottom line is she said those things and meant them. So I don't know how you take those yeah, out of context that's, that's in any way. It's pretty rep, clear. Rep, reprehensible, reprehensible. Anyways, you know, I mean, whatever. Barbara Streisand's, listen, she had her heyday, and now she's just kind of a fucking mouthpiece making a bunch of noise about stupid shit and just shouldn't say that stuff. But whatever. That's Hollywood. Um, so another just an interesting little tidbit. This isn't really massive or anything, but uh, Noah Centineo is in talks to play he man. I didn't, I still don't really know who this dude is. I guess he's been in a few, he was in, was he in band of robbers? Did you see band of robbers? No, yeah. Okay. But the big thing about him is it's uh he's, he's in this Netflix movie. I think it's to all the boys I've loved before, yeah, or yeah, uh, which I, which I haven't seen, but you know, I do think that what's kind of interesting about that is it does show you the effect that Netflix has had on the pop culture. Right. Where this guy, if you don't really follow Netflix movies, you would think, you know, who is this guy? He's a nobody. But then if you look his name up on Twitter, you know, he's been trending for months and he has this huge presence now, all based on this Netflix rom-com that came out. And that goes to show you how Netflix has suddenly become very, very, very influential in pop culture. The fact that it's going to land this guy a major studio film, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's and it's and it's and it's interesting to see that how, that how much you know, they've become a force to be reckoned with in pop culture. Because Masters of the Universe, it's a big movie. Well, yeah. And well, and you have, uh, you know, the band of robbers, filmmakers, Adam and Aaron Nee uh, are directing, which is, you know, it, it's kind of taking a page out of the Marvel playbook in terms yeah. of getting some, you know, uh, smaller scale filmmakers on a big budget film, which sometimes works, uh, say, in the case of the Russo brothers or doesn't in the case of fucking piece of shit Cats of Marvel. Um I'm sorry, it's not a piece of shit. It's just so blandly mediocre. Um, and that's what you get. So who knows? Maybe these, uh, maybe the Knee Brothers will do something great. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I think the biggest thing for Noah Centineo, uh, to quote uh, the old Burger King ad, is, you know, where's the beef? Like, the dude is just not, like, he doesn't look like a super buff dude that's going to play He-Man. Like, you, you think of somebody's going to play He-Man. You think of, like, something like John Cena or yeah, but, you know, what, or you whatever. Get, but you hit the gym. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, too. And that's something that I said. I was like, well, you know, anybody 20, can get 20, in shape. 22 year old guy. I mean, you know. Yeah. So and obviously they're going younger. You know, I would argue he is probably in his late 20s, early 30s. If you're looking at the animated version. Um, well, but it's whatever. He, it's he man, not he boy. But Yeah, not he teenager yeah. or whatever. So I guess we'll see what happens. I, I got to say, I'm, I'm very we got a low investment in uh, Masters of the Universe movie. I love that shit growing up as a kid. Like, I was super fucking into it, like most kids my age at that time. But, uh, you know, it's it's faded to the point where I'm like, I'm not going to lose my shit over whatever the fuck they do. Like, it's fine, you know. And then I guess we should just go through a couple of these quick because it seems like we're running a bit long. But um, You just calm down. So Bill and Ted 3, Face the Music, is 
finally coming, apparently, because you had Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter announce it this week on Twitter. I mean, you know what? I'll believe it when I see it because it's been in the works for so long. I would like to see it, however, you know, and I like the fact that Keanu Reeves is using his kind of, you know, his comeback post John Wick to go and do this movie with Alex Winter. I like both of them. <laughs> I'm I'm of the school of thought that Bogus Journey is far superior to Excellent Adventure. Without so, question. So I'm very curious to see how they do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope it ha- I hope it happens. Let's yeah. see. And, and, you know, I think the the common I think the the common criticism of them doing it is, you know, oh, they're too old or it's oh, whatever. You know, it's I mean, past it, its it, prime. It, it, it's like, yeah, that's the point. But that's though. always been part <laughs> yeah. of the Bull and Ted thing was yeah. that, you know, they go into the future and they see what happens when they get older. And that was kind of like what was alluded to in Bogus Journey and even Excellent Adventure, you know, where they talked about, you know, who they become. So I think it, it's actually very fitting that they're older uh, and I think it'll work just fine. Uh, as long as it's just fun and quirky and weird and, you know, what it was before. Station. You yeah. sunk my battleship. <laughs> they whenever know. whenever I play Battleship with my son, like, if once my battleship gets sunk, I always say it that way. I'm like, you've sunk my battleship. I just, I really hope that they get William Sadler back as death. I truly hope so. As, as the crew. <laughs> So green, you may yeah. be, but do or a big sea streeper, but sooner or later you'll dance with the Reaper. Or is it? <laughs> I love that movie. Oh fuck! It's on Amazon Prime now. So for those yeah. of you that uh, have it, uh, want to scratch that itch, it's there for you. Uh, so Christopher Nolan's next film is uh, gaining traction. We still don't know what it's about, although. I was uh, on background contacted by Warner Brothers when we ran the story that it was going to be some kind of North by Northwest romantic adventure movie. Uh, and they were wanted to be very clear that's not what it is. So uh, you can rest easy that it's not going to be that. Um, the rumor swirling is basically that it's going to be some kind of IMAX themed, you know, event type picture, which is Nolan style. But uh, now casting is coming around with uh the Black Klansman star John David Washington taking a lead role, as well as Robert Pattinson and now Elizabeth Debicki have all joined the cast. Have you uh, seen Widows yet? I have not. Debicki's really good in Widows. Really, really good. I like Debicki. Yeah. I like her. I liked her in uh, The Man from Uncle quite a bit. Yeah, she, she's really good in Widows. Good villain. She kind of stole that movie. Uh, but, anyways, I think uh, that's cool. Like John David Washington getting that opportunity and even Robert Pattinson for that yeah. matter kind of been you know we talked about this uh on a couple podcasts ago when we were talking about the batman casting that you know pattinson has taken a route from the twilight in uh franchise and gone into the indies and kind of like you know really tried to to prove his worth and to make coming into his own yeah yeah so i I think it's nice that he's you know getting that opportunity to stretch his wings again in some some big budget uh fair i think he's earned it Presumably, um, they'll find a part for Michael Caine, even if it's just a voiceover <laughs> in some scene. Well, I mean, if if we're if we're looking at the traditional line of Nolan films, that's certainly the case. Ten on ten. <laughs> it's so stupid. Uh, but yeah, ten on ten, of course. Yeah. Um, the other interesting story out there: uh, the uh, Bumblebee producer. Uh, let me get you his name because I I don't want to misquoted here uh oh we didn't put his name in the story is that oh lorenzo de bonaventura yeah or? Bo- yeah bonaventura sorry uh is saying that you know i'm just going to give his quote because i uh, got to give full context here the audience had asked us several times in different ways i want to get to know a transformer better we did that in some respects definitely a tip uh to what the audience has said to us the interesting part is when you set out to do something like that you don't exactly know the ramifications of it in this case the ramification of it was For the people who didn't love the movie, i.e. me, was not enough action. That's correct, because there's fucking no memorable action. Because you're telling a more intimate story, therefore you can't. So the criticism we got from some fans was like, hey, come on. It was funny. I was just in Japan, and one of the reporters said to me, I love the movie. I love this. I love this. And I was very tired of Michael Bay. I said, "Uh uh-huh. I've heard that before. And he goes, but you know, after watching this film, I kind of wish it had a little more Michael Bay. It was really funny. I said, listen, I can clearly understand i like what michael bay does too two different films two different attempts he goes on to say several lessons have come out of this one is that we have the freedom to tell almost any story the other is that how strongly the audience identified with the strength of character and emotion i know the next transformer our attempt anyway is to sort of do a fusion of bumblebee and the bay movies a little more bayhem 
and a little more of the character falling in love with the emotional dynamic of the movie, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, basically what that comes down to is that even though people love this uh, recycled, boring, teenage bullshit story of, that was Bumblebee, they still miss the Bayhem action because even though that was the strength of the of the Michael Bay movies was the fact that they looked great. The action was bold. It was epic. It was sweeping. And a Bumblebee was just boring. I couldn't tell you a single. I can't remember a single action scene from Bumblebee. I mean, it does. It does kind of need, I think, a bit of Bayhem. Uh I don't know if I necessarily need Michael Bay to direct it, though, because I think the problem with his movies is they've just gotten to be too much. You know, I mean, I'd argue that Bumblebee is far superior to The Last Night. I know you don't agree. But... Oh, no, I, I agree with that. Yeah. The Last Night was like excruciatingly awful. Yeah. It was just bad. Even the the Michael Bay's, you know, signature style couldn't save that fucking train wreck. But I, I love I still love the first Transformers. I think it's yeah. far superior. Uh, to Bumblebee. If they could if they could find something more in line with the first Transformers. Some Bayhem, but maybe not, you know, excessive, then it would be good. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I just, I hated Bumblebee. And and I it, I just felt it was so fucking generic and silly and stupid. And I, I had high expectations, too. I thought it was going to be something yeah. great. I thought it was going to be what everybody says it is. And it's just, it's fucking not. So, whatever. It's the most forgettable fucking Transformers movie ever. I'll be surprised if people are like at home, like, hey, let's watch Bumblebee. I'm like, why? Why do you hate yourself? <laughs> uh, before we, I was going to talk about my Hellboy set visit, but I can honestly kind of skim it. But if you really want to get into the weeds on the Hellboy set visit, I have two pieces up. One of them is a video, so you can just sit and, uh, you know, just listen to it if you want. Um, I went there almost shit a year and a half ago. It was in 2017. So it was quite a bit ago. We talked Bulgaria? to David Harbour. Yeah, I was in Bulgaria. Um, we talked to David Harbour, talked to Neil Marshall, talked to uh, Sasha Lane, uh, Dan- Daniel Day Kim. We talked to the producer Lloyd Levin. Anyways, uh, I-, I don't know that the trailers have sold it as much as, you know, what's actually going on with it. I do think it's going to be a darker, bloodier kind of take on uh hellboy way more closer to the 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 comics and one thing that i think uh, I, don't, I don't know that a lot of people know and a good takeaway is that you know mike mignola the creator of hellboy was extensively involved yeah. in this new version so regardless of how what you may feel about the trailers thus far uh the fact remains that the creator of hellboy is deeply invested yeah. In this iteration of the film where he wasn't quite as much for the Del Toro films, which are more of a signature on Del Toro more so than I think Mignola. Uh, so whether that it remains to be seen if if the movie is actually better than the Del Toro. I don't think it's, it's the thing is, it's not seeking to be better. It's seeking yeah. to be different. Uh, it wants to be uh, a little more grounded. I mean, approach. I'm not. I'm not super enthusiastic about it. Nothing's really sold me on it so far. But I think what's interesting, though, is that uh, with all the news about Kevin uh, Tujihara getting uh, having oh, like yeah. Warner Brothers, the, it's I funny. The woman, the woman that was involved with that, Charlotte Kirk, was apparently the person that Avi Lerner, who was involved with this whole scandal, wanted cast in the Sasha Lane part. But the producer, Larry Gordon, wouldn't go along with it. And apparently... Um, the director of the movie, Neil Marshall, really wanted her. And now him and, and her and Neil Marshall are a thing now. They're together. Yeah. And there was Listen. all kinds of drama behind the scenes about him apparently almost missing shooting days and, you know, and, and leaving the set. And it sounds like it was a fucking train wreck, to be honest. Like, whoa, <laughs> that story is a little bit. You look at that and I'm a little I'm looking at Hellboy now like, holy shit, what was going on? You know, and that makes me feel kind of bad for 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 Harbor and all the other people involved. But um you know, Neil Marshall as a director, honestly, not somebody who's ever super really impressed me. I thought he did a fine job on Game of Thrones, but I don't think that's necessarily just the director. You know, I think there's a lot of yeah. talent involved in that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm curious to see Hellboy. I'd love it to be good. You know, hopefully yeah. it is good. I mean, I'm definitely <clears throat> I'm definitely going to go see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I tend to agree, like, the trailers haven't, like, floored me thus far. But just kind of knowing the background, I I'm hoping that there's a lot of shit that we just haven't seen yet. I do like David Harbour. Um, I'd like to see him, you know, break out. That'd be good. Yeah. And, you know, and, and being on set, you know, we sat down with, we saw Harbour on set. Um, 
you know, and I can talk about that now. Like he was, we witnessed a scene uh, where they go to the Osiris place, uh, which is uh, like a headquarters. And there's like all these uh, practical stuff. And that's another thing you gotta, you gotta take into account here too, is they really push to go practical on this. There's some CGI in the trailer, but uh practical was the first approach and we even went into the the props room and like all the creatures and everything was so like we were literally in a creature shop with like body creature body parts and everything just all over the place so i mean they really did go out of their way to do creature effects so um, i like sasha lane as well she has kind of an interesting story her you know and and it, it might be fun to see her in a movie like this yeah so uh, i think there's a lot going for it um, I will say like when I was on set and I heard David Harbour talking, I, I felt like he sounded ex- like exactly like Ron yeah. Perlman's Hellboy. I, I, felt, but, I felt that way watching the previews as well. Yeah. And I think I mentioned, I might've mentioned that last week, but the thing is though, too, is that they just, they do sound similar. They both have these kind of deep booming voices. And I think that was part of the appeal. And then his cast costume, of- his costume doesn't look as good as Perlman's though. I think it looks better actually. Really? I think oh. we're accustomed to the Perlman one. Uh, and I think the Harbor one is just, it's a little more, it's, well, he's definitely a much more like ripped in the body. To, I mean, that, and that's a, a, a makeup effect. Um, but I think he looks a little more scary, which yeah. I kind of like, but that's, that's just me. I mean, and, and who knows me? I, I, I reserve the right to change my mind at any fucking time. So there, it's but, one uh, of those movies that could either be a real surprise and how good it is, or it could just be total disposable crap. That's yeah, we'll totally see. true. I think that's that's absolutely true. Um, so yeah, go go read the full report if you're interested and see if that changes your mind. There's a lot more in, uh, interesting bits in there uh, that I'm not going to rehash here, but definitely uh, go check it out. A little um, segue then, I guess, into my S. Craig Zoller stuff. I'm just going to play a couple clips, but you know, we were talking about Dragged Across Concrete and the interesting kind of uh, reaction to it so far, and I did get a chance to speak to S. Craig Zoller uh, a little while ago, and I have a couple interesting clips from him that I thought were fun. So the first thing I wanted to play really quickly, it's not a very long clip, but um, you, you, we just talked about Hellboy, how the trailers haven't done much for us. Well, when I originally heard of Bone Tomahawk, I assumed it was going to be just a direct-to-VOD Western. Right, yeah. with Kurt Russell, and not something that I was Same that thing. eager to see. Yeah, and I remember getting set the screener, and I was like, "Oh, this isn't going to be that good." And then I put it on, and I was really surprised at it. And um, I mentioned that to ask Craig Zoller, and he told me a whole story about how now, you know, if you watch the trailers to his movies, they're very specific, and he only ever puts out like one trailer for each movie, and he cuts them himself. And it's a d- result of what happened with Bone Tomahawk, where they cut a trailer that he absolutely hated, and he said made it look like exactly what I described it as. So I'll just play this clip where he talks about the trailer a little bit, and uh, you know, and, and we'll go from there. I, I can't see anybody having made this the same way that you did, and I mean that as a compliment. The same way that I don't feel I don't feel that anybody could have made it the way you did, or could have made Brawl the same way, or Bone Tomahawk. I mean, you know, my my expectations for Bone Tomahawk at that point, I thought it was just going to be a VOD western, and I was blown away by it. You know, I don't think anybody ever expected it to be, you know, this like masterpiece, like it legitimately is. And you know, so I mean, and, and, well, thank you for that. And yeah. You know, Agents weren't helped by that load of manure that served as the preview that I railed against. Yeah. It was the only time there was a preview for a movie uh, of mine that I hated. Yeah. Because I just thought it, it sold it sold it as what you just described it. Yeah. And the amount of reviews that I read at the time where people described how surprised they were and not at all what they're expecting. Um, this is one of the reasons I always like honesty in a preview, mm-hmm. because otherwise you're setting up an antagonistic experience. But uh, maybe your experience wasn't informed as much by the preview. But if I saw that the preview for that movie, I, don't, I, I would probably check it out because I like Western. Yeah. But it certainly sold it as something that it wasn't. Segue to um, what I thought was interesting is that we were talking about the reaction that people are having politically to this movie. You know, how it's a bit of um, you know, a, a magnet for controversy. And, you know, Zoller, in this clip, because I had to ask him about it, uh, kind of doesn't really, you know, doesn't really go into his own political ideas. He he kind of defend he did, uh, it kind of says that he's apolitical and, you know, uh it's an anyway, it's an, I thought this was an interesting clip the way he he described it, you know, he wanted to make movies about complicated people that were like, you know, things like the French connection and he's also very heavily inspired by Don Siegel and Sam Peckinpah and if you watch those movies, especially stuff like Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, you know, S. Craig Zoller's movies really do feel like logical extension of that. 
But one of the things that I found interesting about the movie is that I really don't know how you feel because it was tough to pigeonhole the characters because everybody is, you have characters that are one way, but then also do other things that are completely, you know, contrary to that. And I really enjoyed that. I like that in a movie. But do you think that audiences maybe are a little too... Um, used to having, you know, these simplistic type characters on screen? Like, it, it reminds me oh, of the Fuhrer. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and that, that's, that's one of the things. I've, I've said, and it's not a shield for some, like, diabolical political scheme. I'm, I'm not very interested in politics. Sure. Probably if I was, my pieces would start being um, more Oliver Stone, more didactic yeah. um, agenda kind of pictures. And I'm not very interested. Yeah. And so I write people who are compelling characters and sympathetic characters, they think exactly that I don't believe, mm -hmm. or sort of what I believe, or exactly what I believe. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the same character will say some of these things, but it's not, I'm not measuring it against myself. No. Uh, because that's not, that's not the thing. I'm measuring it against my conception of the character and whether I think that person is true. Mm -hmm. and so in the case of Dragged Across Concrete, I think it's tough, uh, though certainly some people have landed with the idea that, that the, the movie is conservative or, you know, or offensive and, and all that stuff. Um, I think you need to ignore a lot and look at some stuff and say, this is what the director really thinks. Uh, and this other stuff, I don't know why this is in here, but clearly he doesn't think this. And some of that comes from the idea of someone is coming in with an idea about me, the filmmaker uh, and the writer, and is looking for things to support it. Yeah. Now, there's plenty of stuff that doesn't support whatever whatever viewpoint you're talking about, and there's plenty of stuff that does. I, I don't really care when I'm writing uh, where stuff lands, as long as it seems true to the characters, and I find it interesting. Yeah. So uh, people are entitled to their viewpoints. I the, the frustrating thing for me, um, or not really so much frustrating, but I just I like this is something that I think leads to less good movie viewing experiences is people constantly trying to puzzle out what the, you know, what's the filmmaker trying to say? What does the filmmaker really mean? What's the filmmaker about? Like, watch the movie. What, what the character says that because I think it's, the character would say that. And I think it's interesting. Uh, what does that say about the character? Well, you know, so it's, it's, that's the case with, but well, that's the case with almost all of the stuff that's in this picture. It is they're informing you their little bits about the character and they're not, it's not like well, the hero. Here's how I'm getting, um, you know, I'm getting out my political views in such a conflicted and abstruse way that nobody knows what the hell I'm saying. It, this makes sense for this character. Well, this I mean, makes sense for this character. That's what it was like in the '70s too. I mean, if you watch French Connection, I feel like that movie would never get made sure. nowadays because Popeye Doyle, he was a racist cop, and it's just the fact that's kind of the reality of the situation, unfortunately. You know, and I think it's interesting that if yeah. he that he says he's, you know apolitical and i think that he probably has strong views on sure. certain things but i think that the way i think his uh choice of presenting things um is uh, it's it's in contrast to like what's popular in hollywood because they yeah. don't typically show that they typically show either kind of like the the white knight and i'm not talking about white in uh, race color i'm talking just like the mm -hmm. good you know, clean good guy that's just a hundred percent morally right, or you have just like the completely corrupt evil bad guys that have no redeeming qualities, and that's just the truth is like it's not is is a lot more complex than that. Yeah, there's absolute evil people yeah. in this world. There's no no question about that, but there is a lot more uh, complexity in people I than know. just black and white in most regards. Not There's all. a line of dialogue in the movie that kind of sums it up when Don Johnson says the reaction to, or no, it's, it's Vince Vaughn says to Don Johnson, he goes, I find it interesting that the reaction to perceived intolerance is complete intolerance. You yeah. know, and that is very accurate as to what's going on today. And that's I mean, it really that's is. today. You can't like today. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you give any, uh, uh any kind of backlash or, or pushback on something that is kind of a, a popular say notion on uh, Twitter or social media or anything, you know, the you're labeled very quickly into one of two camps, you know, and, and that's kind of what's become this divisive thing where whatever you say, you're this or you're that we even got uh, uh, some negative, somebody wrote a negative review on our beer, the bold podcast talking about, you know, Oh, the, you know, it's great podcast. If you want to listen to somebody, 
uh, be sexist against Captain Marvel or whatever. And I was just like, did you listen to the whole podcast? We actually have two varying perspectives on that. We have one person that didn't care for it. Uh, and and hated it vehemently for different reasons. Then you have another person that you know had I mean, a, a very I, different neither perspective. Of us, neither of us was sexist about it. No, no. But I mean, you know, we presented things that were said, things that were done, and you know, I had a, a, a different reaction than you did. But we still presented that in an open fashion where we weren't like this wasn't like two of us just sucking each other's dicks with the same fucking opinion. Like, oh yes, I agree with you. No, I agree with you. And that's always kind of been a staple to our to the show, too, is that we can we both agree on things and we can disagree on things and offer varying perspectives, which I think is it's what we need. We need more dialogue like that out there. And I think that what Zoller does is he presents us with that kind of dynamic where we get you, you get a lot to deal with, a lot to to carry with you. And I think that's great. I mean, honestly, it gives you something to chew on. I didn't turn off dragged across concrete and be like, oh, well, that was that. I turned it off and I was like, hmm, I got to think about this one. I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things Our, you know, our politics are different. Just the way that we would phrase things is different. You know, like I would never say we were <laughs> sucking each other's dicks. Like I wouldn't, that's not really a phrase that I would use, you know, but it's just, I don't know, it, we're different people, you know, we have different reactions to things and we have different senses of humor. I guess that's why, you know, we disagree so much on things like, like Shazam, but you know. It, that's because you hate fun. Yes, I guess. <laughs> but you know, I, I, we we are different people, you know, and I think teasing. that's that's the point. I mean, that's the point of a show like this. You know, it's it's yeah, absolutely. Kinda, um, anyway, the next thing that we talked about though that I thought was interesting is you guys know that I'm a big Don Johnson fan. You might know this after watching the show. And I, I had just no about, idea. I just talked about how cool I thought it was that Riggs was ex partners with um, Sonny Crockett in the show. Oh man, I like wanted to see that movie yeah. as soon as I saw that newspaper of them together. I was like, yeah. I want the Mel Gibson done. So we, yeah, so we had to talk about that a little bit, and then it turned out that S. Craig Zoller is almost as big of a you know a Don Johnson fanboy as I am, you know, and we ended up having a, a nice chat about it. You also mentioned Don Don Johnson. I have to say, I'm a I'm a huge fan of his and of Gibson and of and of Russell. Of course, you tend to cast my heroes, but uh, I wanted to thank you for the coolest piece of fanfic uh, trivia where you had Crockett and Riggs as partners in another life. Which I want to see that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some, there was it was funny because um, you know we're doing that we're doing that sequence quite a long sequence. Yeah. But when we're putting up the pictures of them in their younger years up on the wall. And then it's like, well, this is really like, these are, you know, and, and, and as much as you say, you know, Crockett and, and Riggs, just also just the reality of like, and these are really two faces of the 80s. Oh, God, yeah. In, you know, a huge way. And then having them sit down. And, well, there was, a, there was a reason because, you know, like I was really insistent on getting Don out there for it, partially because he's fantastic. He is. Partially because he's the most charismatic human being on the face of the planet. And, and partially because... How many people could talk down to, you know, Mel Gibson? It was the same thing with, um, you know, Mel to Vince. And, like, who can be in this situation and realistically just hold it? And you completely buy that this is the one, you know, that Calvert, Don Johnson's character, that Calvert is the one who advanced, that they were there together at the same time, but this guy knows how to politic, and this guy knows uh, when to keep his mouth shut, and, um, you know, and, and is the more graceful guy. And landed in a better place because of it. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, I, I, I struggle to think of any second choice who would have been anywhere near as good in that, in that role. All right. You know uh, last one I want to play is, uh, is so, so, <laughs> okay, we were talking about S. Craig Zoller's next movie. The reason I didn't say what the movie was is because I didn't want Travis to scoop us because he's a film journalist as well. And he absolutely would have put up a story about this. Uh, so, okay, so S. Craig Zoller's next movie is going to be an adaptation of a book that he wrote called Hug Chick Penny, the panegyric of an, ano- of an anomalous child. <laughs> and it's according to the, re- to the description on his website, the Dickensian life of a peculiar looking boy as he tries to maintain a positive spirit in a cruel and uncaring world. So this is a book that was published by Cinestate, the company that makes S. Craig Zoller's movies, and apparently is the basis of S. Craig Zoller's next movie. And, um, he says it's going to be a three-hour black and white PG-rated movie or G-rated movie uh, with Don Johnson, Fred Malamed, Jennifer Carpenter, Vince Vaughn, and a Jim Henson puppet as the titular <laughs> Hugh Hug Penny. Hugh Hug Hug Penny. No, Hug Chick, Chicken Penny. Hug Chicken Penny. 
Because I take that, I take issue with that word titular. That's very offensive. You know, the thing about S. Craig Zoller is <laughs> he said that his next couple of movies are going to be more like dragged and brawl and he's going to go back more to what he was right, doing before. Right. But he does feel the need to do something completely different because he doesn't want to be totally pigeonholed in the genre. And you got to sure, respect sure. that. But wow, it sounds like he's getting free reign to do whatever he wants. So right now I'm trying to get a very different piece set up. It's called The Hug Chicken Penny. The Panegyric of an Anomalous Child. Whoa. And it's, um, it's from a book of mine that has been a book, and then a screenplay, and then a book, and then a screenplay again. Uh, it's a Dickensian orphan tale. <laughs> uh, nice. And uh, far longer than this movie will probably be black and white. So there are many, many hurdles uh, to trying to get this thing done. Uh, we're, we're, we're bringing some of the cast uh, from, from these movies forward, trying to find some other people. It's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, we've already partnered with the Jim Henson Company. Oh. The lead character, the the, the orphan, is he will be uh, an animatronic puppet. Whoa! <laughs> uh, so yeah, the next thing will be a probably over three hour black and white movie starring a puppet. Well, I want to see so it. Though. Probably not. Follow up. <laughs> people expect, but I've just done three movies of men being mean to each other, and I have and and my intended fifth project and sixth project are more in this more in this style, but the fourth one. Uh, if it if it goes and I get it set up the right way with the right control, will be uh, completely different. Um, but you will, uh, I say completely different. But Fred Melamed, Udo Gear, Jennifer Carpenter, Vince Vaughn, Don Johnson. Oh yeah. So in, um, in, in that way, there's there's the continuity. But uh, you know, a PG movie in black and white about an orphan uh, is a pretty different thing. Yeah, but I, I mean that's say, like some batshit crazy stuff right there. But you know, I really want to see it. <laughs> well, and, you know, here, I think we talked about this before because we had discussed it, but sometimes when you get this really out there shit, that tends to be the stuff that, like, makes a lot of noise. Or it's terrible. Sometimes for the best, sometimes for the worst. Yeah, yeah. yeah who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's, like, maybe it's some fucking slice of brilliance that's, like, nominated yeah. for Oscars. Maybe it's winning Razzies. Who knows? But you just, you never know with, like, that stuff because it's kind of, it's very risky, very bold. Uh, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it's. Eh, I mean, it really reminds doesn't. me. It reminds me of when Guy Ritchie did um, that movie Revolver. Oh. That was like all the the Kabbalah stuff in it, you know. And it was terrible. It was yeah. really, really, really bad. And you know, he came back, but it took him a while. But then he eventually bounced back. And I think whenever you do a movie like that, you kind of come back a little bit. And you know, we'll see. I, I you know, who knows though? It might be absolutely brilliant. For all we know, I'm curious yeah. to see it. Cool. Um, so is that, is that, uh, the last you got for, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So, uh, you guys can catch dragged across concrete on, um, it's on iTunes. I actually rented it. Yeah. You know what? I hate to say it, but you know, I've, I've had a couple of Canadians contact me on Twitter wondering when it's coming out. And unfortunately the company that's putting it out here, VVS, they only have certain rights to it and it's not, we're not getting until April 30th. Unfortunately, it's going to be in, uh, It'll be it'll be released on Blu-ray, digital, and VOD, and uh, and, and everything on the on uh, on the thirtieth, I think, of, of April. So unfortunately, it's going to be a bit of a wait if you're in Canada, uh, which really sucks, though, because you know you'd think that they would go day and date because that's just going to lead to piracy. People, I'm sure, that listen to this podcast are going to be going and downloading it illegally now because they want to watch it, and you almost can't really blame them. Uh, you just don't. I just don't understand why they don't go day and date with everything. But anyway, I'm not a businessman. <laughs> yeah it seems like they're just gonna lose money at this point people that would go out and actually support the movie and buy it or rent it are gonna get it for free now well through other yeah. reasons who can blame them yeah i don't do any kind of torrenting shit or anything like that i did like back in the day sure uh never for movies though it was always just for music but this yeah. shit just fucks your computer man i don't even mess with that stuff oh yeah, yeah you're yeah. just you're just I, I, fighting I, I, I don't i don't either but you know <laughs> A lot of yeah. people. I mean, plus, you know, it's an industry. I, I, I feel I would feel pretty guilty. Like this is an industry that, you know, I, I basically work in and it's not that the money goes into my pocket, but I don't see how basically like taking part in criminal enterprise for that stuff really helps support me. Now, I feel this. It, I feel this. It, it's it stales feel your same. integrity, too. And that's just not something I'm going to do. I feel the same way. You know, I mean, the thing is, if you support something, if you want to support something, you should give it your money. But I am frustrated by the fact that, you know, they make things unavailable or they make things only available in certain yeah. reasons. And you're in the U.S., so you guys get everything. But there's a whole lot of other people that don't get that same kind of access. Yeah. And, no, and, I, and I get that. It's a frustrating, that would it be a frustrating, frustrating thing. And it's just, and, you know, if, if people got, you know, 
if it went day and date, it wouldn't even be a question, you know, and, yeah. and I know people that have made independent movies, you know, my, my, I, I'm fr friendly with the people that made Turbo Kid. And that was one of the most pirated movies of the year, the year it came out. And they made no money from it. And it was super popular, all because of pirating. And they, and the and they made no money for it, you know, and, it, and it's too bad. And it, it's unfair. But, you know, it's a lot, some of the blame, not all of the blame, but some of the blame, you know, belongs to the studios, though, that don't make it available in a timely member yeah. for, timely timely manner for people it's a comp it's a weird thing i I'm, i i wish i could say i fully understand i it. I, I do get very frustrated though when people you know something comes out on on digital and they go and they download it illegally when you could give a couple bucks and see it legally that yeah i mean it's it was seven it was seven dollars to yeah. rent drag I and think, i guess and i think that's completely i think that's a that's a completely reasonable and i think that's if oh, you're a completely. fan of that's what completely you're and you know, and it's like, uh, you get it for like two or three days now. Like, the, I think iTunes has extended their rental yeah. period, so it's no longer twenty four hours. You get more time. So I rent movies from them all the time. Yeah. Uh, so now we'll we'll head into uh, some listener questions. We don't have too many, so we'll uh, we'll run through these real quick. Uh, Ulysses, uh, one of our longest uh, running fans, he loved Shazam. Right there with you, Ulysses. I loved it as well. Can't wait to see it in IMAX. Um. He says best DCU movie. Uh, I don't know about that personally, but um, it was very good. Uh, are we excited for John Wick Chapter 3 and will it live oh, up God, to the yes. hype? Obviously very excited. Living up to the hype? Mm, Who knows? That's tricky. Yeah, it's, you, just, you, you won't know till you see it. I hope it does. Yeah. Uh, he says he's watching The Watchmen Ultimate Cut in 4K. Cool. I'm sure it looks great. I actually started watching BVS, the Ultimate Cut, last night because they had that Zack Snyder thing going on this weekend and just had me thinking about it. Um, and uh, there's, there's, the, I still have the same things that I love and the same problems that I always have with it. I think it, uh, the Ultimate Cut, there's way too much things that are unnecessary. It takes too long to tell the story. But at the same time, I find it so frustrating that the shit that they cut to make to make a theatrical cut for BVS made the movie incomprehensible in terms of the, the overall plot. There's things that are in the ultimate cut that absolutely needed to be in the, the theatrical cut to make sense. And they don't make sense in the theatrical cut. It's just, it's kind of baffling the level of like cutting that went on that movie that just ended up making it kind of nonsensical in the theater. So anyways, uh, the ultimate cuts, the only way to watch it, I think, but even then it's still, it's too long winded. It's too, it's too long. Um, but still with some really great shit in there regardless. Uh, let's see. Sean McKee. I know whatever happened. My dream project is a Zack Snyder directed a Vader movie. That would be pretty badass. You have to agree. Uh, between three and four hunting down remaining Jedi thoughts on this. And what would your star Wars dream project be? My star Wars dream project still and always is, uh, seeing, uh, Ewan McGregor back as Obi-Wan. I want to, I want to yeah. know more about him between, episode three and episode four i feel like Me too. it's just this beautiful unexplored territory at this point honestly uh i think he is probably my favorite star wars character it was luke skywalker for the longest time but i'm sorry to say i'm one of those people that you know after last jedi it really just kind of soured his entire legacy for me and i didn't even, i haven't even put my luke skywalker statue back up because i'm just you like, know you know um obi-wan's probably still my favorite character too and i'd love to see the, the you and morgagor obi-wan movie get made you know who i'd love to see directed um gareth hugh edwards or evans gareth hugh evans the raid oh, guy fuck there you see gareth uh, edwards already had his uh, shot no, no, no. Gareth, up with gareth, gareth, gareth hugh evans the the, oh, the okay. raid guy i think he would do a great job That'd be fucking badass. I would yeah. love to see what he did with a lightsaber. Fuck, could yeah. you imagine? Yeah. Jesus Christ. But yeah, I mean, there's just like, there, I feel like there's, it's, I mean, you're talking about what, 20, 30 years, something just like that. Give me Jedi, though. I want to see Jedi. Yeah, want the but force. that's what I mean. Like, Obi Wan is like, he basically is the one that brings the Jedi back in that sense because he, you know, he finds Luke. Uh, that, well, he's always known where Luke is, but gives Luke that lightsaber. And really, he just kind of like, initiates reinitiates the jedi back into the universe in that way and it's like i feel like there's so much that he learned and did in that time frame and i'm sure there's a bunch of shit about it in the 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 books and all that but there's so much that you could do there's so much that you could do so that's that would be my dream project still and always and if they did it as a tv series 
uh, that would be cool too. So who knows? Maybe there'll be an announcement. I'm actually um, <clears throat> little news. Actually, we got an invite from Disney, which is uh, a wonderful development, and I'm going to be going to Star Wars Celebration. Oh wow, uh, Chicago! So uh, looking forward to that, and I'm hoping that there'll be some uh, cool announcements. I know that they're going to have a Mandalorian panel, which is cool. I'm positive they'll have an Episode Nine trailer and an Episode Nine panel. I think they already announced they'll have an Episode Nine panel. Um, but I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, I've never been to Star Wars Celebration, so it'll be a new experience for me. I'm glad that we're getting Disney stuff again. Yeah, actually, quite a few. We're we're gonna do the uh, Endgame junket, press junket. Oh wow! Um, and we're doing uh, Toy Story Four junket. So it's yeah, it's really nice. Like we kind of reached out to them and kind of got back on good footing. And good. Uh, that's nice. So, because they uh, are they run everything now. So. <laughs> I know. Right? So, just in the nick of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last question that we have, uh, and this is a sp- oh no, there's two actually. What are your thoughts on Batman in the '90s? I don't really think we'll feel the '90s influence. To be honest with you, yeah. um, I don't. I don't feel like Gotham City in the '90s is the same kind of you know '90s in America kind of thing, and it's not really that kind of story. So. You know, I made some jokes like I was I was uh, comparing it to Captain Marvel, just having a little fun on Twitter. Um, I, I but I just I don't see that I don't see that really being a heavy influence. I think it's a time period, but I don't know. Batman's kind of in a he's in a weird mixed time yeah. warp, like with Gotham City. He always they were always kind of futuristic a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I I don't see how you make that fit. Like when you you gonna play Vanilla Ice is like. You know, Batman is driving the Batmobile downtown Gotham no, no, or something. When like, no, and he's fighting Mr. Freeze. Ice, 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 baby. Ice, baby. <laughs> Just have been an ice play, Mr. Fucking. Fucking, yeah, he's Batman. Yeah, I'm sure. ice Batman. <laughs> Yo, drop that zero, get with the hero. <laughs> oh, fucking shit. There it is. We just cast your Batman, Vanilla nice. Ice. <laughs> um, This is one for you. What does comic book movie fatigue mean to you guys? I don't have comic book fatigue. Yeah. We're living in a fucking golden era of awesome fucking comic book movies. When I was a kid, there was nothing on the horizon that indicated we would have something like this. Like they Hollywood actively scoffed at the idea of making a superhero movie. And I remember reading the reports like we tried, we put people in the costumes and they just looked silly. Like they just didn't get like we really kind of lived in a I lived in a weird time growing up when <clears throat> even thinking about making a superhero movie was unheard of because like it was just too stupid or silly or you couldn't be done. So even at their worst, which I think Captain Marvel falls into that category, it's still not a fucking that painful of an experience. You still have highly <clears throat> rendered effects that look really great. You still have, you know, this the mythology that's there that you just would be unheard of back then. So I don't have I mean, co- for, for me. I do have it to a degree. I mean, I, I still can appreciate a super film movie. Fun. I just, you know, I find that it's kind of become every genre, <laughs> though. You know, and I miss the the action movies that you know you used to have. I miss almost star driven type movies that you used to have back in the nineties and the two thousands or the eighties. You know, I mean, like, when am I going to see the next like Beverly Hills Cop, like a movie like that, come out? You know, I rewatched yeah. that last week. You know, you don't really get movies like that anymore, right? You would, it would I do, seem I like do such agree an with indie you, now, and I and I kind of. I kind of miss that, you know. Well, see, I like, miss that, but I don't have fatigue over comic book movies. Yeah, as a result. I, I just, just I feel those. They still movies, made those too. Yeah, they just they make so much money though. They've like taken the air out of everything else though, and it feels yeah. like everybody's chasing Marvel's success. I kind of wish that people would just leave it alone and just let Marvel do their thing, and you've got Marvel for the superhero movies, or you know, and, and DC maybe. But then every other studio wants to do that kind of thing, and I just wish that they would kind of leave it alone. You know, Marvel does it really well. DC is doing it pretty well too, but let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I agree. I mean, I, I grew up in the same era as you, you know, like where, you know, action movies were the genre. Like that was what you got excited for each year. Like this year, you know, it was like, oh, Avengers Endgame and this, and which I'm also excited for. But, um, you know, growing up, it was like, oh, Demolition Man's coming out yeah. or Last Boy Scout or Lethal Weapon or, you know, those types of movies. And you're like, that's what you got excited for. But those movies just don't really exist. But I think, you know, there there's a few on the horizon, you know, like the new Rambo, which I'm super fucking pumped for. Yeah, me too. Um, I mean, 
that's a that's a great one on the horizon. But it's also it's calling back to Stallone. You know, there's no yeah, there's no new stars that are taking up those. Yeah, movies. there's no new Stallone. That's for sure. Yeah, there's no new Stallone. There's no new Schwarzenegger. I guess you could argue The Rock is, but The Rock makes pretty. Let's let's be honest. Pretty you know family friendly fair. Yeah, he's not he 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 dipped his toe in the R rated stuff, but it didn't work. Um, though. yeah, it just it didn't really happen. And you know he's he's a star and I, and he's got charisma. And I I love The Rock, but he's just not Schwarzenegger. He's very different. He's his own kind of thing, his own animal. But uh, I have I don't know Hobbs and Shaw. I, I'm excited for that, and I think Hobbs that, and Shaw I'm, I'm more excited for than than I have been for a Rock movie in a while. But I do love the Fast and Furious movies. They're just fun. Yeah, I do too. I, I think they're a total blast. So I think there's hope out there. Um, and I think that I, I truly believe at some point we'll see the the eighties and nineties action movies kind of come back. Cause I think people will miss them. And I think that, you know, just like Westerns and, and all that other stuff, you, we still get Westerns made. We still get, you know, we, we don't, they're not the, the top genre at this point, but it's a cyclical thing. And, you know, we'll see how it yeah. goes. I, I think superhero movies are here to stay. Um, and that's that's totally fine with me. But I think there's certainly room for other stuff. And I think that it'll start to sneak back into into theaters as time goes on. Wow, Paul, is this our longest podcast ever? We're at about two and a half hours now. Plus my S. Craig Zoller stuff. Boy, this is epic. This is about as long as uh, as uh, this is. This is the big one. Hateful eight level. It's epic. <laughs> it's, it kind of fits perfectly with our Quentin Tarantino yeah. and our and our S. Craig Zoller discussion. We are. Yeah. It is, this yeah. Is, it's dragged across concrete level. This is the this is our dragged across concrete episode. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got listen. If you got a long flight, you got a long Super drive. Size. Look at that. You, you know, you could stretch this one out for a week. Yeah. Uh, I am going to try and get this up. I'm going to get this up audio, the audio version up much earlier in the week. The video version takes a long time to get the YouTube yeah. one done. I had a lot of problems yeah. this, this last. Uh, this this week getting the video version done it is very time consuming um so that but i do have a special thing for those of you that have stuck it through uh we are doing a giveaway of glass on blu-ray Ooh. uh so i actually thought for a second you were just talking about random glass hey bag of glass who wants a bag of I'm glass i'm give you a bag of broken glass. I'm going to go into my cabinet and I'm just going to break a glass and put it yeah. in a baggie and I will send it to you straight from the beard on Blu-ray. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but somehow I'll do it. Uh, no. So we're going to give away a uh, copy of glass on Blu-ray. So uh, all you need to do is just go and like, uh, I'll put this up on our Instagram page because we're trying to build up our Instagram page. And I apologize for, you know, lack of updates sometimes, but uh, it's still growing and, Fuck, I got a lot of shit to do, so I'm just trying to, to maintain it. And Chris, you can jump in there anytime you want. <laughs> put something in there. But uh, I'm going to put up a post uh, for the glass giveaway. So all you need to do is just go make sure that you follow us uh, and like the post. And um, yeah, you could win a copy of Glass on Blu-ray. We've been giving away stuff so far. We gave away a copy of uh, Hunter Killer on 4K. And we just gave away, did a uh, uh, some hoodies for captive state uh, and both of those have been given away as well they've been sent out from the nice. studio so uh, i'm going to try and do more giveaways and stuff like that just to you know kind of reward you guys uh for being fans and for listening because we do appreciate it especially sure listening do. to our long three-hour epic um i don't appreciate the fuck face that left the terrible review on itunes because they were offended um but hey at the same time in a way i kind of appreciate it because it's like you know, we are that we are hitting a lot of different notes here. Chris and I are different people, but we're also very similar, which is great. And that's you know, it, that is what makes doing this show fun for me. Um, I don't need to sit and talk with somebody that I agree with everything on. I like to hear other perspectives because uh, it helps inform mine. And then that's what you should do too. I'm not trying to tell you how to live, but you know, come on, let's yeah, all be tell friends. How to live? Chris got very offended when I said sucking each other's dicks, and I think that's hilarious. He's probably going to tell me to cut that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so anyways, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Again, I'm going to try and get this up early. Uh, make sure you like uh, and follow for the uh, uh, on Instagram, Beard and the Bald Podcast. Uh, for the glass giveaway, I you know, look forward to getting that out to you guys. Also, please go and give us some stars and a nice review on iTunes. I was only kidding when I said, or give us a bad review. I don't want your bad reviews. I want the good ones. 
didn't your mom teach you guys? You know, if you only have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Let's yeah, do that. Nice. Our, let's do that on our iTunes page too, please. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, but uh, anyways, regardless of whether you do or don't, I don't care. If you're listening and you're enjoying the show, that's all that matters. We enjoy doing it. Um, and we hope that uh, we inform you and, you know, entertain you. That's what we're here for. We're entertainers. For sure. Right. So thank you for joining us. And that's it. Chris, do you have anything to add? Anything you want to leave anybody on? No. Any, uh, any be, tunes? Be well. So, be well. Be excellent to each other. Be well.